All right, guys. So here we go. Uh, let's see if we can uh, wrap up uh, what we've been able to, to do the last few days. And uh, so real quick, a real quick recap. Uh, let's see. What should we talk about first? We found the average value of any function f. Uh, let's see. Viacana, can you help me with this? What was the average value of some function f that we discussed uh, a few days ago? Um, it was the, the integral question, mark. Right? Yeah, it was the integral. And then I had something. Um, oh. It was from the beginning to the, like a B. Okay. And then, and then it was the function. Yeah. And then what did I have in front of this? Oh, one over B minus A. Perfect. And then we proved that guys, we said, uh, if we wanted to find the average velocity, you would find the displacement divided by time. And then we said displacement was nothing more than the integral and then divided by time or the a, B minus A is just your change in time. Uh, so then we said something like, I think we also said, if I want my position at B and I'm, I apologize guys, they're cutting the lawn. So I don't know if they're, if you can hear all that noise there. Uh, is my nothing more than my initial position plus the integral from A to B of velocity. And they're related as you can see. Uh, so that's going to find me my position for any value. And then, of course, there's FTOC, fundamental theorem of calculus, where we said the derivative of an integral from some constant to x of f of t dt is nothing more than just f of x. And then the fundamental theorem part two, where it's just upper minus lower. And, uh, and now we're going to put all that to good use. So we're going to try and uh, see if we can uh, figure this out. Uh, don't be scared, guys. Uh, this is the first time that we are viewing all of this in extreme. It, like we're pretty much all putting it all together. Uh, and uh, we have our first mock exam coming up. So hopefully we'll see where we are at. And don't worry, guys. Uh, the first one is always the toughest one. But if we can get through this together, I think we'll be all right. Okay, so I'm going to guide you on question number one. And as we continue, uh, you guys will, will take more and more leadership of these questions. So here we go. We got the first one. This one's coming from the 2019 AP exam, which was the last full administration. This is a calculator active question. So that means you can use a calculator. I'm going to be using Desmos, and Desmos is limited to what it can do. Uh, so I prefer they use a calculator. I am going to get a license for a TI-84 emulator on this laptop today. So uh, by tomorrow, I should be able to use that. Should I close the window? Yeah, close one. All right, question number one, guys. So here we go. Let's see if we can figure this out. It says, fish enter a lake at a rate, this is a rate, modeled by the function E, given by E of t equals 20 plus 15 sine pi t over 6. Fish leave the lake at a rate modeled by the function L of t, given by that expression. And then it says, both E of t and L of t are measured in fish per hour. And t is measured in hours since midnight. And they tell us t equals zero. They're being nice. They're telling us that midnight is referenced as t equals zero. And then letter A says, how many fish enter the lake over the five-hour period from midnight to 5 a.m.? Give your answer to the nearest whole number. All right. Putting it all together, guys, what feels right on this? Like, what should I do? I think I heard someone say it. You can read it again if you need to. I want to know how many fish enter this during this five hour period from zero to five. This is how many fish, this is the rate of how many fish enter. So it doesn't tell me how many fish enter. Well, okay. It tells me how many, the rate at how, at which, how many fish enter, but it doesn't tell me the total number of fish that entered. So how do I find the total number of fish. Find the average. Find the average or what? Uh, you're close. I think maybe you're reading letter B where it says the average. Mm, how do I find the number of fish, guys? Find integral. What'd you say? I didn't hear you. I said find the integral. Perfect. The integral of which one? Of E of T. Yes. Excelente. Uh, you use the integral, so the number of fish entering, this hashtag, right, 
number of fish entering. This is the total number of fish entering within that five hour window. Is nothing more than the integral from zero to five. And if E of T is defined by this expression, you can just type E of T. This is the calculator section, guys. So on this one, it's fine to do that. So now I'm gonna show you how to enter it in Desmos. I think by now we're semi-professionals, I think, right? So I'm gonna go to Desmos, guys. So here we go. I'm gonna switch my little application here. Switch application. And I click on Desmos. And what I want, I do want a graphing calculator because later on I'm gonna do something fancy. And I'm gonna call this E of X. I know it says E of T, but I'm gonna call it E of X because I want Desmos to calculate stuff for me. So I'm gonna go to ABC. I'm gonna go to capital E and I'm gonna put parenthesis X close. I'm gonna push equal and I'm just gonna enter what E of X equals. 20 plus 15 function sign. Oh, it was under trig. And I'm just gonna put pi t over six. Division pi x over, there we go. I have a nice graph. I don't really care about the graph at the moment. And then I just come over here on, uh, on number two, on table two or command two, command line number two. And I'm just gonna go to functions and I'm gonna go to miscellaneous and there's an integral symbol right there. And I just go zero to five. And I can just type on the inside. I have to put parentheses though. E of X. And then close that dude and then put DX. And voila, you get a nice magic number. 153.457 if it's truncated, eight if it's rounded. It would be cool. It would. Godina said, wouldn't it be cool if they shaded in the area? Uh, and I already forgot the number that I got. What was the number? 150 what? Oh, give me the digits first and then we'll round it. Okay, so to the nearest whole number, I would just write 153 fish enter during time interval t equals zero to t equals five. One nice sentence. How do we feel about that one, guys? Perfect. All right, now look at the next one, guys. What is the average, OMG, what is the average number of fish that leave the lake per hour over the five hour period from midnight to 5 a.m.? Have we discussed how to calculate average of anything? Yeah, we did. Right here. They actually are saying what's the average rate. They're just not saying it. Uh, but look, what is the average number of fish that leave the lake per hour? See, leave the lake per hour. That's an average rate over the five hour period from midnight to five. So they're actually saying what's average of L of T. Does that make sense to you guys? Perfect, so I'm gonna write average. Oh, what's up, Ladina? Okay, so Gordina said, will my units always match? Uh, for the most part, your units will be consistent for free response questions because they recognize it is a timed exam. Uh, if they want you to really focus on the unit, they will probably be screaming at you somewhere along the line well, where they say, pay attention to your units, quote, quote unquote. And they won't scream at you the way, the way your parents scream when you got to clean up your room, but, but they'll scream at you somehow. And I'll show you towards the end of how college boards scream when they do scream. Uh, so anyways, uh, so yeah, guys, let's just go ahead and calculate that average here. One over five minus zero, integral zero to five. And because I want the average of L of T, I can just type that L of T because L of T has already been defined as that expression. On the calculator section, this is enough. You do not have to actually calculate by hand the antiderivative. Uh, so there it is. And then I'm just gonna type my answer. So I'm gonna go back to Desmos and I'm gonna use L of T. 
So let me see if I can switch here. And I'm gonna go ahead and type LOT down here. So I'm gonna go back, capital letter L, and I'm gonna use X, and I'm gonna say equals, and your LOT was four plus, and then two raised to the power 0.1 X squared, 0.1 X squared. Uh, there it is. There, the graph is pretty cool. We're going to talk about the graph in a little bit. Don't worry. Uh, and then from there, I'm just going to go ahead and start calculating. I want the average. So I'm going to put a little division sign here. I'm going to put a one in the top, a five in the bottom. Uh, I'm going to move to the right and I'm just going to type in an integral. So I'm going to go integral and I'm going to go zero to five. Okay, so they're testing to see if you can uh, if you have the tools necessary to type all of this into your calculator. L, X, close, and let's see if it's gonna wanna work if I just put the BX there. Yeah, it worked. And there it is, there's your average rate, 6.059. I do not know if they wanted it rounded. I don't think they did, or they didn't ask for a whole number. So this is your average rate, put at least three digits after the decimal or your thousandth place. So 6.059. Six point zero five nine, and this is fish per hour. Leave the lake, fish per hour. All right, I think we're good. Look at letter C. Now we're gonna start looking at the graph here, guys. See if it makes sense. At what time between zero and eight is the greatest number of fish in the lake? Justify your answer. All right, let's look at a tape. Let's look at a graph. Let's look at our graph. See if we can figure this out. So they want to know between zero and eight. So I'm going to go to click on this little wrench and I'm going to click on my X axis. I don't put zero there. And I go to this dude. If you want to put it at 8.5 to see a little bit past it, that's fine. But I'm going to put 8. And I need to figure out my Y value. So let's see. Uh, the smallest this will ever be is 5. Because uh, at 0, 2 to the power 0 is 1. 4 plus 1 is 5. So I'm going to make that 0. And then the biggest E or L will ever be is, let's see, I took pre-cal. So 20 plus 15, so that's what, 35? So I'm going to go to 40. So good thing we took pre-cal and algebra, guys. Yay. And then enter, and there it is. So there's a beautiful graph right there. So, and don't, uh, just listen right now, guys. I don't want you guys to write anything at the moment. So just take this in real quick. This red graph is EX. This is how many are entering. This green graph is how many are leaving. These are, these are rates. These are rates, guys. So at the moment, between zero and this intersection, there are more fish entering than leaving. Do you agree with that statement? Yeah, you can see that because the red graph is larger than the green graph. By larger, I mean the magnitude of the Y value there. And those, those Y values are just rates uh, in fish per hour. So uh, if you follow this arrow, the red graph is bigger than the green graph all the way until they, they intersect. They intersect at 6.204. As soon as I pass this intersection, now the green graph, there's more leaving than entering. Does that make sense to you guys? All right, so let's see if we can figure this out just with, just with analysis, critical thinking. So the number of fish in this lake, was it a lake? Yeah, it was, right? The number of fish in this lake between zero and where they intersect at 6.204, the number of fish is getting larger because there's more fish entering the lake than leaving the lake. And then right at 6.204, they are both equal. And then immediately after 6.204, there are more fish leaving than entering. So as soon as I pass that 6.204, the number of fish in the lake is decreasing. Does that make sense to everyone? Perfect. So... Let's go back to the problem. And uh, what did I say? I needed this number, 6.204. There's a word for that. It starts with the letter C. Do you guys remember that word? It's a critical. Critical. Huh? Cooling. 
did you say critical number? Yeah, critical number. A critical number just means that there, there's something going on, guys. So what do I do as soon as I have a, a value here? I'd like to create a table, T. This is your justification here, number of fish. And I like to do zero and then your critical number, which we got six point something, I already forgot it, and eight. And let's see, is there a formula for figuring out the number of fish? Number of fish is equal to the integral uh, from zero to some time value of how much have entered minus how much have left. Does that make sense to you guys? The integral gives us the total number of fish. Yes or no? Yes. Perfect. The E is how much has entered. The L is how much have left. If you are like Chavez, you don't have parentheses. All right, there it is. There's parentheses. It's understood in the math world that we don't necessarily need them uh, because the DT indicates that we are ending right there, our integral. Are we cool, guys? Okay. So here we go. I'm going to go to my Desmos. And uh, let's see, I haven't tried both of them out, but I'm pretty sure it's gonna work because it should always work. Uh, so I'm gonna go integral and I already forgot this value over here, uh, 6.204. The more digits you can put, the better, uh, 6.204. Okay, so I'm gonna write zero down here, 6.204. And we are limited with Desmos to that uh, accuracy right there. But if you have a calculator, put the exact, and then I'm just gonna go e to the x minus L of x. So I'm gonna go e of x minus L of x. Close, and it's not gonna calculate anything until I put the dx in there, dx. And there it is, guys. So 135.014 or 015 if it's rounded, 135. 135.01, did I say five? And I already forgot the number guys. What was the critical number there? 6.204. 6.204, and at zero it is zero. How did I do that so fast? At zero it's zero fish. How did I do that real quick guys? Without even thinking almost. When the limits are the same, there's no, um, you didn't move, so there's no like area underneath. Hey, guys, exactly. Guys, don't be a robot. Don't be a robot. Uh, when, when the limits, when my upper limit and lower limit are the same, you haven't moved. The time hasn't moved. So if there's no time, if the time hasn't moved, this is from zero to zero, there's nothing to calculate. It's zero. You haven't moved. There's no fish at zero. And then do I even have to bother calculating at eight? Yeah, well, the table is a justification. Uh, I would put, okay, this is a very picky situation. You got to be 100% sure that this one is not applicable. I'm going to put not applicable since this is a local min. And they want the greatest number. If you are paranoid, if you are paranoid, go ahead and plug in the number eight and plug in the value in there. This will be full credit because anyone who's reading will understand like, oh, okay, this kid understands that at eight, this is some value that's smaller than 135. And I guess a local min technically could be, uh, could be higher than 135 uh, by definition of what a local min is. But I'm sorry, what? the local min of uh, the graph of, of this output, if I were to be graphing this expression. That makes sense? The graph, uh, Godina says, this is the local min of what? If I were to somehow plot this equation uh, into an X and Y uh, for all of my T values, this eight would be smaller uh, than at 6.204. And if you wanna put that number guys, it's not hard to do. If you wanna put that number, uh, just let's just let's just put it in. 
So here it is. There's my expression. Is there a way to copy paste? I think there is. Copy. Oh, do I got a? Mm, okay, I'm just going to change the 6.204 to 8. So I don't have to type all over again. Is that cool, guys? 8. There it is. 80.9199. If you want to put it in your table, go for it. Okay, here we go. The last one. And you know what? I would probably erase the word local and I would just put this is a min or a number smaller than 135. Since this is a number smaller than 135. And we know that for a fact. All right. Is the rate of change in the number of fish in the lake increasing or decreasing at 5 a.m.? Explain your reasoning. Ooh. I like that one, guys. I think it's going to trick a lot of people. How do we do it? The derivative of the integral. What do they want? What does it mean? Is it talking about the number of fish in the lake? Is the number of fish in the lake increasing or decreasing? Is that what they want? What are you guys thinking? Tell me what you guys are thinking. Should we take it to Ms. Grajeda so we can see uh, what it means? <laughs> guys, look, delete this word. Wouldn't it be average? Is it, is that, uh, it's not asking for average. Uh, it's not asking for average. Delete the rate of change. So scratch that out just temporarily. Don't scratch it out with a pen. Is the number, I guess, and then erase the end. Is the number of fish in the lake increasing or decreasing at 5 a.m.? Okay, I just changed the question completely. This is what they do not want. If you're reading this and I'm like, oh my God, I'm so confused. They do not want to know whether the fish is increasing or decreasing at 5 a.m. They want to know is the rate of change increasing or decreasing at 5 a.m. So what does the word rate of change mean in calculus? Yeah, you said it, but I haven't heard it from these guys yet. Derivative? Perfect, perfect, Deenan. The rate of change means derivative. So what they want to know, rate of change, go ahead and put that in your, in your notes, guys. This means derivative. This means derivative. Don't write that on the real AP exam, right? This means derivative. But what they want to know is, is the derivative increasing or decreasing? Derivative of what? Is the derivative of this expression. Let's see, how much are entering? E prime minus T prime. Oh, uh, leaving, L prime. If you don't understand that, relax, relax. I think this is this is the best answer in my opinion. I like this one the best. I want to know which one's bigger, E prime or L prime. Hopefully that makes sense to you. That's what it means. Which one's bigger? If E prime is bigger than L prime, then my rate of change is. So not everyone at the same time. I'll say it again. If E prime is bigger than L prime, my rate of change is? Increasing. Yes. If L prime is bigger than E prime, my rate of change is? Decreasing. Okay, someone besides Mazuka. Gonzalez, do we understand what we're talking about right now or no? Be honest. Um, I'm just like, uh, I don't know, I'm confused. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Guys, everyone just admitted that rate of change means derivative. Yes or no? They want to know if my is my derivative increasing or decreasing. That's it. Of the number of fish. E of t tells me how many are entering. L of t tells me how many are leaving. These are, E of t and L of t are already rates of change. I'm taking the derivative of E, the rate of change of E, and I'm taking the rate of change of L. If L prime is bigger than E prime, remember that L prime stands for the rate of change of the rate of how many are leaving. And E prime, st prime stands for the rate of change of the rate of how many are entering. And yes, I know it's a play on words, the rate of change of the rate, uh, but that's what it means. If there are more leaving than entering, then your net rate, we're talking about the net rate, then the net rate is decreasing. Maybe that's gonna help guys. The net rate. 
your overall rate of your ENL. Gonzalez, does that kind of help? Yes. So tell me what I just said. Um, so you have to take into account the fish entering and leaving, and then it's asking if the net rate is increasing or decreasing. Yes, the net rate, though, of, of E and L. So it's like taking a derivative of your derivative. That is hard. It is hard, guys. Uh, yeah, I think it's going to make more sense the more we do these. Uh, but that's what they want. Uh, I, I'm going to figure out a better way. I, I guess we can always reference like E is just a general function. And I want to know the rate of change of E. Well, the rate of change of E is E prime. Does that make sense? And then L is just some function. And yes, I know it's a rate, but it's just some function. And I want to know the rate of change of that function. So I want to know, is my, is my rate of change of that function increasing or decreasing? Let's go back, because uh, I really want to make sure that you guys understand this. I'll say. Mm -hmm. I'm listening. Correct. Oh, because they're already rates. They're, okay, so Godinez asked a question, guys. She asked, why can't I just find E of 5 and L of 5 and compare those values? Those are already rates. These are telling me how many fish are entering at 5 and how many fish are leaving at 5. This is not telling me how fast the, the rate of the rate is changing. This is just telling me at that moment, is the number of fish increasing or decreasing? So in case you're wondering, this at five is just telling me the number of fish increasing or decreasing. Let me go back to the graph. I think the graph will help. At t equals five, do we understand it, Gordon? Okay, in a little bit, I'm gonna have you say that to everyone. All right, guys, so look at this graph. If I were to tell you what's E of five, well, E of five is just that number right there or close to it. Uh, e of five is 27, something like 27. And then L of five is something like 9.65. And all that is telling me is that the number of fish is increasing at five because there's more fish coming in than more fish going out. There's more fish going in than out. I don't want to know that. I want to know the rate of change. So the slope here, this red line, it's obviously negative here. And the slope here at, at five, it looks like it's positive. And the net change, well, let's see. This slope looks like it's steeper. No, it looks like this one. Well, that's what we got to fi figure out. We, we got to figure out the net change of the change. Okay, Godinez, can you come over here and, and tell them what you just said to me? I think that will help them. Okay, can y'all hear me? Well, say it over here. Oh, Hi, okay. friend. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, so basically, I was like, what? Why, would, why do we need to find the derivative? if what we have is already the rate, but if we were to just find E of five, like Tav said, it would just tell you how much, how many fish are increasing, how many fish are entering or how many fish are leaving the rate of that. And so if we find a derivative of that, then we find if it's increasing or decreasing because y'all remember how we said like, if F prime prime is positive, then F prime is increasing oh, and F is concave up, it's related to that. Actually, you said it perfectly. Uh, if F prime prime is positive, F prime is increasing. If F prime prime is negative, F prime is decreasing. That's exactly what we want, right there. I don't know if that helps, but that helps me. Does it, is it making more sense, guys? Okay, check it out. You're gonna be mind blown. Did you know that Desmos gives you the derivative of a value that you already have in here? Look, you have E of X, you have L of X. Look at this. I can just go E prime. Oh, if I can, oh, here's the prime right here. And I can type in the number five. And look at that, guys. Oh, this is the first time they have seen this guy, uh, Ms. McLaren. They haven't, uh, we haven't uh, calculated derivatives with decimals before until just right now. 
it does the same thing for L. So check it out. I'm already taking a guess. If E prime is negative, all I got to do, so all L has to do is be bigger than negative six. So let's see, L prime, oh, did I already get out of there? Of uh, five. Oh, I, I didn't even put prime in there. Sorry, guys. There you go, prime of five. <laughs> L prime of five is definitely larger than E prime of five. So because that is true, so what is my justification? Here you go. I would write those numbers down and I already, I short term memory, uh, I already lost it. Oh man, sorry there guys, didn't mean to do that. Okay, uh, L prime of five, I already forgot what that number was, but I know for a fact it's larger than E prime of five. Because of this statement, the number, the rate of change of the number of fish is the rate of change in the number of fish is decreasing. And don't worry, we're gonna do a whole bunch of practice. So maybe this was probably the wrong question to start off with, because I, I hit you guys with a pretty tough one right off the of bat. Uh, so now let's uh, bring it back. It's gonna be a little easier now. Uh, yes, Godinas. You know what, let's look at the rubric. How about that? Is that cool or no? Hey, Gonzalez, do me a favor. Can you put uh, 2019 scoring guidelines and let me know when you have uh, question number one ready to go? All right, what's the question, Bodina? Ask. E prime minus L prime is definitely negative. Yes, well, that and L prime is larger than E prime. Your both statements are the same. You're okay. So Godinus is saying is E prime minus L prime a negative number, and it is. It is a negative number. Um, is this the same thing as saying E prime minus L prime is negative? Yes, it is the same thing. I prefer this. Uh, e prime minus L prime is negative is the same. It's the same thing as saying E prime of five minus L prime of five. That is some negative number. And uh, I think Wadina probably prefers that because she understands that if F prime prime is negative, that means F prime is decreasing. So I think maybe for you guys, this might be an easier statement for you guys. Um, both statements are the same. If you can see by algebra, if you move the L prime of five to the other side, you'll get L prime of five is greater than E prime of five. Does that make sense? Gonzalez, you got the 2019 AP scoring rubric? Uh, not yet. Okay. No problem, miss. We, uh, you don't have to look for it right now, right now. But later on, uh, we would like to, or do you guys want to look at it right now to see how we did? I haven't looked at it myself. I mean, I saw it eventually. There was a time where I had to look at it. Uh, I didn't grade this question that year. I have a question. Yes, ask, please. Um, for D, like, would the fundamental theorem of calculus apply? Because I know we're taking the derivative of, are we taking the derivative of it? You're taking a derivative oh, of, uh, of E and L, right? So I wouldn't mention anything with FTOC on that one. That's a good question though. Any other questions on this, guys? Gonzalez, you got it ready to go or no? Don't worry about it. Um, I'm having a hard time finding it. No, don't worry about it, miss. Don't worry about it. Let's come back. Now we're, I think this one's the easier one. I think we should have started with this one. This is the one that we have more experience with. So my apologies, guys. But it's okay. I think it's good to, to see the struggle and the good fight. All right, guys. This one's from 2005. It's a whole question. Uh, it is a no calculator question. So notice that we have a velocity graph. 
in meters per second. Notice the time is in seconds. Uh, notice that we have, it looks like it's just all linear line. And I think we are good to go. So let's see, number two. And it wasn't the number two question on that year, but it's the number two question in our sequence here. A car is traveling on a straight road between zero and 24 seconds. The car's velocity V of T in meters per second is modeled by the piecewise linear function defined by the graph above. Okay, happy face. Letter A, find the integral between zero and 24 V of T dt. Using correct units, explain the meaning of zero to 24 V of T dt. All right, Ms. Hernandez, what do you think, what does this mean? So don't, don't find it just yet. I just want to know what that means. Like from, like from zero to 24 seconds, the velocity. Mm. Well, remember that this means, okay, don't worry, you're thinking too fast, so slow down. This means area under the curve of velocity to compute the area under the curve. What does the area under the curve of this velocity graph give us? Displacement. Yeah. It's going to give us the displacement or the distance traveled. Look, meter, use the units to help you out, guys. Meters per second times second. So the seconds cancel out. So do you see that, Hernandez, how this would just give you meters? Yeah. So this is the displacement. Can I also say the word distance? I tried to use an accent there. Uh, can I also say distance? Why? Why can I say distance also? Because it's positive from zero to 24. Uh, the velocity is. Perfect. OK, so uh, Ms. Mazuka almost, uh, oh, you said it perfect, but you started off with saying it. Guys, avoid saying the word it at all costs. As a matter of fact, take it out of your vocabulary. Avoid saying the word it at all costs because you're not being specific. If you just say it is positive, well, what, what, what is positive? So the velocity is positive. Because the velocity is positive, this tells you the distance traveled or displacement. They're both correct. I, I would say distance is the better one, guys, because the velocity is always positive. Uh, the distance traveled in these 24 seconds. So, and then let's calculate what this is. Uh, this looks like, what does that look like? Just like a trapezoid? I took geometry. Did you guys take geometry? Oh, you guys didn't take geometry? How do I calculate the area of a trapezoid, guys? I don't know, Travis. Is it? Base one plus base two times height divided by two. Yes. Guys, you can always just use geometry to figure out these areas. If you are paranoid and you're like, I don't want to use a trapezoid formula because I haven't used trapezoid formulas in forever, then fine. Break it down into a triangle, break it down into a rectangle, and then calculate the area of those two triangles and calculate the area of the rectangle and add them all up. Uh, if you feel that that's going to take you too long, then just do it in one shot with a trapezoid. Uh, it doesn't matter how you do it. The answers will be the same. So here we go. Because this is a trapezoid and we have linear lines, uh, the equal sign is the best sign instead of approximate because this is going to be exact. Uh, let's see. First trapezoid, the first base, if you want to call this the first base, is 24. Plus a second trapezoid, the difference between 14 and 16, what's that, 12? And then I'm multiplying by the height. It's always the perpendicular height, guys. So that's going to be a 20 and dividing by two. Uh, I kind of don't want to tell you this, but I'll tell you. Uh, you can actually leave it like that. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and recommend that if you're confident, solve it. For my exam, I want to want to see it solved. But for, on the real deal, on the, on the real exam, if you are paranoid, you can actually leave it. And they will actually give it to you. But uh, I can tell you that uh, people won't be happy. Uh, so here we go. <laughs> 2 goes into 20 10 times. I would just cancel that out. 24 and 12, 24, 34, 36. 36 times 10, just add a 0 to that. It wasn't hard to do that. Put the units. And then you still haven't gotten the full credit. You still haven't done that part, guys. 
It doesn't have to be a, it doesn't not, okay, do not write an essay. Do not write an essay, guys. Please do not write an essay. Just one sentence. The more you write, if you write a whole bunch and you say one incorrect statement, everything is null and void. So you're just going to write a quick statement and say, from t equals zero to t equals 24 to comma, the car traveled a distance of 360 meters. There it is, beautiful math, nice and concrete, done. Cool or not cool? Awesome. Let's go to the next one. Letter B, for each, B prime of four and B prime of 20, find the, the value of, uh, okay, obviously a typo on my part, and explain why, or, or explain why it does not exist. That should be an or. Indicate units of measure. Okay, V prime of four. Can I find V prime of four? Why not? It's not differentiable. Yeah, guys, it's not differentiable. Why am I not differentiable, Ms. De Leon? Why, do you, why is velocity not differentiable at four? Because I have a what? The what? Differentiable at four? Yeah, why am I not differentiable at four? Because it's a corner? Yeah, it's a corner. Good job. Yeah, it's a corner, miss. V prime of four does not exist. It's a corner. Okay. Uh, that will not fly. We let it fly last year. Last year was probably the only time that that was an, an excuse, excusable. Uh, College Board and ETF has, uh, has screamed at us and told us that we need to have clear communication uh, when we are doing math. And even though, yes, we are communicating that it does not exist because there's a corner, you got to tell me with math. So how would you tell me with math? Hey, relax. You know, I saw some of you guys give me, giving me that look like, what the heck? All right, look, guys, it's really simple. You just do this. Limit. Oh, my God. There's limits again. Of X approach is 4 from the left-hand side of V prime of 4 equals. Actually, don't put the number 4 in there. Put an X in there. We know we're approaching 4. Well, if I approach four from the left-hand side, what is this slope? What is 20 divided by four? Not everyone at the same time. Five. Yeah, five. And then we're gonna go over here to the right-hand side and write limit as X approaches four from the right-hand side, put a little plus symbol of V prime of X equals if I'm approaching four from the right-hand side, look what's happening, guys. If I'm approaching four from the right-hand side, what's my slope? Zero. Yeah, zero, good job. Do these match? No. Hence, V prime of four does not exist. This right here would give you the credit because it's proper communication. You're telling me that you definitely know calculus, that you're the derivative from the left-hand side is five, the derivative from the right-hand side is zero, the derivatives do not match at four, hence the derivative at four does not exist. Uh, last year, we made an exception. Uh, because we did not finish the year, uh, we made an exception and, for, and that was probably the only time that that exception will ever be done. Uh, so don't, uh, yeah, it's not going to apply this year. Uh, now everyone's better trained and everyone's, uh, we've had a whole year to uh, perfect that. Uh, College Board and ETS screamed at us last year and now they're going to expect us to get it correct. All right, there it is. Straightforward. We got it. Oh, we still haven't finished this one. And that one's going to be a simple one. V prime of 20. We go to 20. Yeah, that one definitely has a derivative. It's a nice straight line. It's right in the middle of this line. So all we do, let's see, uh, we just use our algebra skills. We went down 20 and we went to the right, uh, what is that, eight? So what is 20 over eight? 
10 over 4, 5 over 2. Positive or negative? Negative. Yeah. OK, guys, uh, real quick, remember that the derivative of velocity is acceleration. Derivative means slope, correct? OK. How do we feel? I should have let you guys take uh, control of that one. What's up? Oh, yes. Uh, indicate units of measure. Thank you, Godinas. I was about to miss this. I was about to miss the points, guys. I need units. Uh, units are meters per second per second. I actually like that best. If you want to write meters per second squared, go ahead. They're the same. Meters per second per second is ideal, guys. Go to the next one. Letter C. Let A and T be the cardinal acceleration at time T in meters per second per second. I love it. You know what? I think that's actually important enough to chat about real quick. Let's chat for 30 seconds on this. Uh, go to your juniors. Not you juniors. You juniors know. Or go to uh, the sophomores and tell them, I guess let's make up a number. What number do you guys want? Three? T tell them, what does three meters per second squared mean? What does the acceleration mean three meters per second squared? It means three meters per second per second. Well, okay, does that help? I think this helps clarify a lot of things, guys. It means that your velocity is changing three meters per second every second. So if you start initially at zero, after one second, the velocity is three. And then the next second after that, the velocity is going to be six. Why? Because I keep adding three meters per second every second. Then I go to nine. Then I go to 12. Does that make sense to you guys? And hopefully, I think this is obvious right here. Uh, I think a lot of times students get confused with units, three meters per second squared. Like, what does that mean? What does that mean? I think if you do this, I think it's easier to see. Three meters per second per second. So every second, your velocity is increasing by three meters per second. So make sure that your classmates know that, guys, because uh, dimensional analysis is a big deal uh, as you get further and more advanced in science and math. OK, let's, let's talk about this one now. Let AFT be the car's acceleration at time t in meters per second per second. Thank you, College Board. I love that wording here. Between 0 and 24 seconds, write a piecewise defined function for AFT. OK. I think we can do this. Uh, we can do this, guys. We took algebra. A of t, piecewise function. I go to my velocity, and I look between 0 seconds and 4 seconds. Find me the slope. Evangelista, what do you think the slope is of this line in blue? The slope is 5. Yeah. How'd you do that so fast? I did 20 divided by four. Yeah, it's five between T and four seconds. I think we also did it earlier, right? Oh yeah, there was, I already already fun, by the way. All right, let's see, Ms. Curtis, can you help me out here? Ms. Curtis, can you tell me the slope of that line in green? Is it zero? Yeah, it's zero. It's flat, it's horizontal. Zero for four less than T less than, and I already forgot that time value over there. What is that, 16? Okay, now the last one here, I'll do it in, in black. Uh, let's see, Ms. Carreon, can you hook me up with uh, the slope of this one in black here? Negative five over two. Yeah. I think we had already found all of them. So I think College Bowl would be nice on this one. 16 all the way to 24. Do not put equal signs. And there it is, piecewise function from algebra two. Oh, because uh, we're not putting equal signs in the bottom because uh, the, the acceleration does not exist at four and at 16 because of the corner. All right, uh, here we go. Last one here. Now find the average rate of change. Oh, there's that word again. <laughs> find the average rate of change of V 
over the interval A to 20. Does the mean value theorem guarantee a value of C between 8 and 20 such that V prime of C is equal to this average rate of change? Why or why not? I love it. I love it, guys. And I hope you guys love it too. Look how awesome this is. It does not matter how you, like, how you're thinking about this. Uh, like, how do you guys want to think? The calculus route? We said that average, okay, let's talk about what rate of change means. What does rate of change mean? Lanford, what does rate of change mean? The derivative. Yeah, guys, it means the derivative. So what is the derivative of acceleration? Oh, I just said, what is the derivative of velocity? Sorry, guys. Pretend you didn't hear that. What is the derivative of velocity? Acceleration. Acceleration, yay. So guys, this is saying what's average acceleration. So if you take it by, oh, average acceleration, that just means one over, and I want it between eight and 20, 20 minus a integral eight to 20 of a of t dt. There it is, average acceleration, guys. And hopefully you're thinking like, okay, Mr. Winters didn't teach me this. He said, Mr. Winters said that the average acceleration is a change in velocity over the change in time. Hey, relax. We're in the same team. That's actually what this formula means. Look, antiderivative of acceleration, that is velocity. So look, I'm going to write this again. 1 over 20 minus 8. And look what you get. This is just v of 20 minus v of 8. That's antiderivative, guys. OMG, look at this v of 20 minus v of 8 over 20 minus 8. Hey, Mr. Winters told me that acceleration is the change in velocity over time. OMG. Isn't that the change in velocity up there? Isn't this change in time? It does not matter how you do it, guys. Calculus or the physics route, we still going to get the same answer. Isn't that awesome? That like, Do you see how everything's connected? Okay, I hope that you guys see how everything's connected. All right, uh, velocity at 20. Velocity at 20 is, I'm gonna go back to my graph, and it looks like it is 10. Don't just look at and say it looks like it is 10. I know 100% that it is 10 because that slope is negative five halves. Uh, it was 16 at 20. So if I go down, if I go to the right two, I'm at 18, and I should go down five, that's 15. So if I go to the right two, now I'm at 20 and I'm at 10. Travis, you went too fast, what did you just say? I went to the right four times and I went down 10 times because my slope is five halves, a negative five halves. So V of 20 is 10. V of eight, I don't know what V of eight is. I don't remember it. V of eight is 20. And then 20 minus eight, that's 12. So this is a negative, let me see, negative 10 over 12, which reduces to a negative 5, 6. And I need units. Meters per second per second. And we still haven't answered the question. Are we okay so far, guys? All right. Check it out. Does the mean value theorem guarantee a value C between 8 and 20 such that V prime of C is equal to the average rate of change? Why or why not? All right, Ms. Barrera, help me out. Can I use mean value theorem here between 8 and 20? So let's go to the graph. So between T equals 8 and T equals 20. Wait, was it? No, uh, 20 right here. So between this interval... Can I use the mean value theorem? Um. Yeah, that's a hard question. What do you think? It's okay, miss. Just tell me what you're thinking. Well, because at 1620, you can't take the derivative of that. Miss, you, you, know, you are absolutely correct. So what does that mean if you can't take the derivative there? So no. Miss, you are an absolute genius. You are correct. Way to go, miss. Guys, Barrera was right on point. You cannot use the mean value theorem because you're not differentiable at that corner. 
And you can just say no, MBT does not apply since we aren't differentiable. Oh, sense velocity. Don't say we, since B of T isn't differentiable at T equals 16 seconds. Perfect. Perfecto. I thought that was pretty good, guys. All right. Let's do one more. Uh, and I, you know what? I think uh, we're just going to have uh, Godina lead you on this one. Is that okay, Godina? Yeah, I think we'll all do it together. So Godina is going to lead you guys on this one, guys. Uh, she's going to read it for you guys and everything. This is all on the spot. So she has not seen this question at all. And uh, we're going to see what's up. Mr. Okay. Chavez. Yes, ma'am. Before you go on, can you educate me on what you meant by differentiable? I don't even know if I spelled it correctly, or maybe oh. what ladies can. Yeah, I think Godinez or who, uh, can you assist Ms. McLaren on what does it mean to be differentiable? Help me. What do you guys think, guys? What do you think, De Leon? What does it mean to be differentiable? Um, I know it like you're differentiable if you're corner or cusp on a graph. Yeah, but what is what does the word differentiable mean? Like what what am I looking at? Like why am I not differentiable? You're you're right, corner or cusp, but differentiable means that I can find a what? Or you can find a slope? Yeah, I need to find a slope where I can find a slope, an instantaneous rate of change, correct? And so at 16, I cannot find an instantaneous rate of change because there is a conflict. From the left-hand side, it is flat. My instantaneous rate of change is zero. But on the right side of 16, it is not the instantaneous rate of zero. Does that make sense to you guys? Ms. McLaren, does that make sense to you? Yes. Would you like to repeat it? Uh, what I, no, I'm kidding, Ms. McLaren. Ms. Godinez, go for it. I have it in my chat, I mean, in my notes. All right, Ms. Godinez is going to take care of the next question, guys. Uh, I know that we've been going pretty hardcore on this, uh, but I think, I think we're ready. Uh, so uh, a synopsis for this question real quick. Uh, they give you the, the F prime graph. And on the F prime graph, you're given areas why I, you guys can read it. So, Godinez, do you want to read it for them? And then you guys can figure it out. Okay, guys, we're going to do this together. It says, the figure above shows the graph of F prime, the derivative of a twice differentiable function F on the closed interval 0 to 8. If the graph of F prime has horizontal tangent lines at, look at my pull a child, x equals 1, x equals 3, and x equals 5. The areas of the regions between the graph of f prime and the x axis are labeled in the figure. The function f is defined for all real numbers and satisfies, satisfies <laughs> f of 8 equals 5, 4. Okay, that's a lot to take in, but that's fine. All right, keep going. Find all values of x on the open interval 0 to 8 for which the function f has a local min. Just by your answer. Oh! Okay, so where do we start, guys? Before you even begin, what graph do you have? F prime. Yeah, we have F prime. They want to know where F has a minimum. So I'm going to look where F prime changes from what to what. Negative to positive. Yeah, negative to positive. Way to go, Aleman. All right. So, Ochoa, help me out. Looking at that F prime graph, where does F prime go from negative to positive? From 5, negative 2, to 8, 5. 
Yeah, but there's an exact coordinate. Give me an x value. At x equals what? Six. Perfect. There it is, guys. You got it right. So we're going to make a statement on letter A. So hook me up with that statement. Oh, I can uh, Mazuka. Mazuka, hook me up with the statement of what I'm going to write. Um, okay. F has a local minimum at X equals six. Because? Because F prime it goes from negative to positive. <laughs> at? At X equals six. Perfect. Perfect, guys. I'm sure that if we were to give this statement to Ms. Grajeda, that she would fix our sentence to make it even more efficient. But this is efficient enough. There it is. Everything is concise and accurate. Done. Full credit. Perfect. Okay. Now let's see if we can answer. Ah. Oh, just a pinch. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, letter B might be a tough one for us. It might be a hard one for us. Let me take care of B because that one might be kind of hard for us. Okay. And then we can take her back for letter C. Is that okay? Okay, this is the first time you've ever seen a question done like this one, guys. Uh, so letter B might be hard. It says, determine the absolute minimum. So it says absolute min here of F on the closed interval 0 to 8. Notice that this is including our endpoints. Do you guys notice that? All right. So as soon as you see this, I always love when it comes to absolute min and absolute max, my best bet or our, what I love as justification is a table. I love tables. And that is a justification, guys, a valid one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write X and I'm going to write F of X. And I know that I, you always, always, always have to check your endpoints. Okay. Now, before I even write values, before I even write values, guys, I'm going to see if we are really understanding. We're not robots. Tell me where you think my absolute min is going to happen on F. Let me explain to you what's happening for F. Think of F prime. Well, actually, we don't have to make any scenarios. We're, we're good. We know what, what's happening. Remember that F prime tells you how F behaves. If F prime is positive, F is increasing. If F prime is negative, F is decreasing. Cool or not cool? So all you're thinking about right now is whether F is going up or down. Okay. Between zero and this value here, one, two, three, four. Between zero and four, F has just been going up. Think about it. Up, 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 up. So that four is definitely a max. And that zero at X equals zero, not this point here in particular, but at X equals zero is a min. Do we understand why we have a min at X equals zero? I'm not saying a min at F prime. That's ridiculous. Obviously, that's a max at F prime. I'm saying min on F. Does everyone understand why that's a min on F? Okay, in case you don't, visualize the point and you're just going up, 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 up. Look, you're just going up. I started here. I started at the bottom. Now we're here. Oh, that's a song. If you guys know what we're talking about there. Okay, anyways, let's continue. Now, from four all the way to six, you're going down. Down, 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 down. I didn't go down for that long. Look, how many times did I go down? I just went down three. And then I go up, 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 up. Okay. In your brain, in your head, and I know we've been going pretty hard, guys. Where do I have an absolute min for F? Six. Okay. Well, I definitely have a minimum, but is it the absolute min? So let's think. I, I started... I, I'm just, this is a, a really bad sketch. I went up, 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 up. I went down for a little bit. Up, 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 up. Really bad sketch. It doesn't look like that. Where am I going to, where are we going to? At X equals zero. Yes. Why at X equals zero? Because that's the lowest point. Well, yeah, that, yeah, that's the lowest. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. At, uh, I think you're going to explain it to me right now. Perfect. 
uh, yes, that is the lowest point. Uh, you should talk about the areas of the region because guys, this derivative graph goes up for a majority of the time. It only goes down, remember what the area of the curve tells you, it only goes down three units between four and six. That's it, it just goes down three units. But I had been going up, let's see, two, six, so I have gone up between zero and four, I went up uh, eight. And then I went down three, and then I went up seven. Now, this is the first time you've ever gotten one that you have to work backwards. So look, I'm gonna put zero, and then some critical points. Always put your critical points. I have a critical point at one, I have a critical point at four. Someone tell me what a critical point is, by the way. Anyone? Um, when the function crosses the x-axis. Uh, okay, give me the definition of a critical point. When critical point is when the derivative is? Zero. Zero or? Undefined. Zero or undefined. In this case, zero, but zero undefined. All right, look at this, guys. Think, if, if you're having a hard time with this, think of F prime as velocity and think of F as position. They give me my position at eight. My position is four. So we gotta go backwards. So here we go. I'm gonna say, I can find my F. I can find my position at any F value by, by knowing F of eight is four, so four, plus the displacement from eight to any value X of F of T dt. It doesn't matter what variable we use there. Does that make sense to you guys? Be honest. Tarion, does that make sense or no? Can you repeat it one more time? Yes. My position for F at any X value is nothing more than the, the initial position that was given. My initial position was the time eight plus my displacement. Think of F prime as velocity. So if I want my position in any X value, it's my initial position at eight plus the displacement. Yes, we put eight at the bottom because we're, we're working backwards, guys. This is the, the value that they give me. Tarion, did that make sense or no? Uh, yes, F prime. Almost. Yeah. Sorry, guys. How come no one corrected me, guys? I was saying velocity. That's F prime. F prime is velocity, guys. We're looking at area under this specific curve. Lanford, do we understand what's going on? For sure? Okay. Gonzalez, can you explain to me what I'm doing? I'm so confused. Why? I don't get why you have to use the area. Because the area tells us how much I've gone up or down. Uh, just like if it was a velocity, if I've told you that I have a train going 50 miles an hour, 50, that's a 50, and it travels for three hours. What does the area under the curve tell us? The distance that it traveled, 150 miles. Same thing with a graph. If I have the F prime graph, if this is F prime, and the area under the curve is 150, that means F went up 150 within the time interval of three. Does that make sense to you at all or no? Yes. <laughs> Okay, tell me what I said. Okay, so you have to take the area of the derivative to find uh, the F value, like the original. Why? Because it's like the derivative of the... Uh, what wait, the antiderivative of the derivative will give you the original derivative. Yeah, you're thinking too hard. Miss, what does, uh, what does the area under a velocity curve tell you? Um, displacement. Yeah, displacement. And from physics, if I want to know any position, isn't a position just displacement? Like if I want to know my position at B, don't write this down, just listen, guys. Isn't that just my position at A plus the displacement that I've done between A and B? Do you agree with that statement or no? Yes. Okay. 
I'm doing the same thing. Mis displacement is just the area under the curve of velocity. Uh, so what am I trying to say? If I go F prime and I write my integral symbol, this is just giving me how much F has changed, how much F has gone up or down, like the difference in, y in the values that I've moved. Does that make sense to you or no? Be honest. Uh, yes, that makes sense. <laughs> okay, so can you explain to me what this integral means, why I have that four there? And can you explain uh, this again to me, please? Okay, so you have the four there because that was given from f of eight. And then you have to add um, the integral there because that's going to be the area of the curve for the other values to see. Um, so so the, what does the area under the curve tell you, though? How much what? Uh, <laughs> the displacement? I don't know. Look, okay, it's a displacement. If, if F prime was velocity, it would be displacement. Since I have F prime, it just tells you how much F has changed. No? Wait, can you explain it like one more time? <laughs> yes. Yes. Area under a velocity curve is displacement. But I'm, good, I'm just calling it F prime. So area under F prime tells us how much F has changed. Okay, I think you'll get it this way. If I go in, if I go A to B of F prime of X dx, I think you'll understand this, I think, I think. What's antiderivative of F prime? F? Yeah, it's not a trick question. I'm not tricking you, miss. F. And then I just evaluate F of X from A to B. So that just means F of B minus F of A. Well, isn't by definition, isn't that just telling me how much I have changed? How much F has changed? Yes. Yeah, that's all I'm doing, miss. This right here, all this that I'm circling in blue is telling me how much F has changed from eight to some value X. Okay, that one made sense. Okay, now I'm gonna ask you again. Tell me again. Okay, so the integral. I'm, I'm gonna interrupt, Mr. Chavez. I'm wondering if Nadia or somebody could use a real world example with this problem. Like I know a lot of them are driving and I might be stretching this, but if they applied, like we're talking about velocity and displacement, is there someone who could maybe have an example that would illustrate this change? Yeah, Just we have we have an example right now on the next one uh, where this is exactly the same. Uh, yes, uh, I feel like I think I just rushed into this too quickly. We do know this. I, I can assure you we know this. It's just that uh, we've been pushing these guys pretty hard. Um, all right. Yeah, I think the train example is the easiest one. Let me just, okay guys, so let's start at, at plane one. Let's just start from scratch and we're gonna go really slow, really slow guys. So I have a train and this train is going 50 miles per hour. And we're talking about hours and we're gonna go slow. So I'm going 50 miles per hour for three hours and pretend, let's just pretend that this train could magically change directions. And I'm gonna say, what's a good number? And I, I need a nice number. Uh, I'm going to say we're going 100 miles per hour in the other direction for two hours. So this is at five. Okay. And I'm going to go slow, guys. Time out right here. So for the first three hours, how many miles did this train travel? One, you 150. How'd you do that? How'd you do that so fast? 50 times 3. Yeah. 50 times 3 is 150. Notice that this rectangle, this is my velocity curve. Notice that that 150 is the area underneath this curve. Are we okay so far, guys? So if I were to write integral from 0 to 3 of V of T dt, you would tell me 150. And my units would be miles. Are we okay, guys? All right, now I know, I know it's impossible for this train to change directions at a moment, at a moment's notice, 
But let's say that this moment from three hours to five hours, this train went in the opposite direction, going 100 miles per hour. So in two hours, how many miles did it travel just, just during those two hours? 100? Yeah. How'd you get that? 100 times two. Perfect. And I want you guys to notice that area under this curve is 200, but negative, negative. So here's the question. I'm going to go ahead and write it out right here, guys. From three to five of V of T V T equals a negative 200 miles. So here's the question. If I were to tell you uh, that initially my initial position at zero was, uh, let's make this up, 10. I want to know where am I at at three. I just want to know my position. I started out at mile marker 10. I'm going to call this mile marker. Uh, so mile at 10 miles. And at three, I've traveled 150 miles. That's not my position. I've traveled 150 miles. So what's my position at t equals three? It's not one, it's one with a number on it. I've traveled 150 miles and my initial position was 10. And I wanna know my position at three hours, at exactly three hours. Is it 160 miles? Yes, how did you do that? Because you started at 10 miles and we've traveled 150, so you just add them together, right? Yes, perfect, brilliant. Okay, now I wanna know where I'm at, at five. How do I figure that one out? I don't know, Travis. At, at three, I was 160 miles. But remember, between three and five hours, I moved to the left in the opposite direction, 200 miles. So at three, I'm at mile marker 160. Where am I going to be at at t equals five? Negative 40? Yes. How'd you do that, miss? I subtract 200 from 160. Perfect. That is exactly what we're doing, guys. Exactly what we're doing. We're not doing anything different. So look, let me go back. All I'm going to do, don't, don't write anything down, just listen. All I'm doing is calling this F prime and calling this F prime. And instead of calling that X, I'm calling this F. See? So if my area under the curve between zero and three was 150, and I started off at 10, I can just add 150 to the initial, and there it is at 160. If I know that area under the curve between three and five is negative 200, and at three, I'm at 160, I subtract 200, and I'm at negative 40. So all I'm doing is finding area under curves and seeing how much I move to the left or to the right, if we're talking about velocity. If we're talking about a graph like F, all I'm seeing is how much F has changed. And I, I realize that maybe I hit you guys too hard. Uh, maybe I tried to put too many ideas together all at once, and this should have been scaffolded over a three-day period instead of a one-day. Uh, so maybe this is on me. I think this is on me. Uh, but do we kind of see the idea of, of where this is coming from? Okay. Uh, sorry, guys, if I, if I feel like I hit you guys too hard. Um, let's see if we can figure this table out now. Let's, we're going to try. <laughs> um, you know, not no big deal. We will come back to it again when we're ready for it. When X is 8, the, uh, the value is 4. That was given. Are we still okay, guys, with that or no? Okay. Uh, so at six. So I want to figure out where I'm at at six. So I know that between six and eight, between six and eight, I move to the right seven times. So I got to subtract seven from my value that I have here. So four minus seven is negative three. Does everyone see where I got that negative three? Okay. What about at four? So at 
four, I went, let's see, between four and six, I went to the, I went to the left three. So I got to go backwards and add three. So negative three plus three, that's going to be a zero. Do you guys see where I got that? What about at one? Negative six. Yeah. Let's see, is it negative six? Yeah, negative six. And then at zero, negative, negative eight. What do you guys think? Wait, why are we going backwards? Oh, because uh, we're going right to left. Look at the integral here in blue. The number, I have an eight there. So when I type in the number six up here, you're counting backwards. They get, yeah, they gave us f of eight. They didn't give us, in the example I gave you, I gave you f of zero. In the example I gave you, I gave you f of zero. They gave us f of eight. So we, we have to go backwards. You know what I mean? How do we feel, guys? Do we feel okay? okay? And please ask questions if you're like, okay, I don't understand that. Uh, we are going to go back to the notes 34 today. So I don't want, like, if, if you're scarred from notes 34 and like, oh, my God, I never want to see those again. Relax. <laughs> you're going to see them in about 20 minutes. Uh, huh? No, no, please. Because then I will know that you're talking about my class. And I don't want my class to scar anyone, guys. All right, uh, so hopefully you like my hashtags. It's a tribute to the class of 2018. Uh, these are the hashtags that they wanted on their AP Calculus banners. So those are the hashtags that I went ahead and decided to put in there. I put si se puede and mujer power. Uh, in case you don't know Spanish, mujer means uh, girl power. Um, but we're in San Antonio, so I would hope that you know that. But in case you don't know that, now you know. Uh, so all right, guys, so let's talk. Uh, so we know that at the most basic idea, the most basic idea, this means area under a curve. And it, it literally just means area under a curve from A to B. So if I have a function and I call this f of x, and this is A, and this is B, it literally just means the area under that. That's all it means. Now, of course, different situations, they'll mean different things, right? Uh, depending on what that f of x stands for, if it's a rate or if it's a speed or something. All right, so the first thing I do is let's explore area into the curve from zero to four of x dx. So let's do it first with the fundamental theorem of calculus, which means take an antiderivative, plug in your values. So I'm gonna do antiderivative of that. So what's, this is the x is your f, guys. So what is the antiderivative of x? X squared over Q. Perfect. I was actually thinking about calling on you, Ms. Deenan. Uh, so it's crazy that, that we're reading each other's minds here. Uh, X squared over 2. Um, the lower limit is a 0. The upper limit is a 4. I guess I should tell you that most professors, because it's just one term, would probably like to see this. This is probably the neatest it will ever be. Uh, that line means evaluated at. Yeah, for you computer scientists, for you programmers, uh, that's what that line means, guys. Uh, and then we're going to do upper minus lower. I like to put brackets. If you don't want to put brackets, that's fine. No, you don't have to put the brackets on that. And then I'm just going to do upper minus lower. And I can, you can put the equal sign after that. Evaluate. It's fine. It's perfectly mathematically nice and symbolic. If you want to start a new line, that is fine, too. It does not matter. So new line, you always do upper minus lower. 4 squared over 2 minus and then the lower one, zero squared over two. I'm not insulting your intelligence. Please, no one get mad. I know that zero squared over two is zero and you don't even have to write it, but I wanna show steps, guys. I don't want anyone to be lost. Okay, are we okay so far, guys? Okay, I see you guys nodding. At least half of you guys nodded and the other half were just like, okay, whatever. I hope you at least have the volume on. I always wonder, like, does someone just <laughs> turn turn on the Zoom, mute me? Like, 
I don't want to listen to anything he says today. And yeah, that's possible. I guess it could happen, right? Yeah, like if you're a university student, there's 300 people on Zoom. You're like, you know what? I don't want to listen to anything. Mute, but you want to be there for attendance, right? Yeah, that's sad. Anyways, uh, here we go. Four squared is 16, 16 divided by two. You were laughing really hard there, miss. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got the number eight. Let's see if it's true. Here's y equals x all the way to four. I'm trying to make a linear line, and I know we're in 2021. I should probably be using the shapes that I have in this in this software, but my old school butt is like still like, no, I'm going to draw it. So I drew it. I can say that, right? I didn't say anything crazy. Because it's y equals x, that height there is four. So I said it means area under the curve. This is a right triangle. Is that triangle really have an area of eight? Well, let's see. Four times four is 16, 16 divided by two. OMG, it matches. So there it is. We did this part, we did this side with FTOC, Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. We did this part with geometry. They both match. Chavez, what do you mean fundamental theorem of calculus? I took the antiderivative. Uh, antiderivative of x is x squared over 2, and then I just upper minus lower. So that's what fundamental theorem of calculus is, one of them. Uh, what is the other FTOC, which we haven't used, but we are going to use eventually, very soon. The other FTOC is constant variable, f of t dt. And I'm taking a what? If you take a derivative of your integral, you just get the inside. That is FTOC as well. Both of those are a fundamental theorem of calculus. One is taking the antiderivative, the other one is taking the derivative. How do we prove one from the other? When we took the derivative of the integral, we got f of x. I think this is the one that we proved. And because we proved that one, then it shows that the integral must mean antiderivative. Does that make sense to you guys? It makes sense to me, but I've been doing this a long time. It didn't make sense to me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for confirming. You said yes, and it made sense, right? <laughs> no, I said it didn't. Oh, man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I thought you said the other one. Man, I am so... Okay. Um, this right here, you see how this says derivative ddx? And then we prove this with pictures. Uh, I can't prove it right now because that would require a different lesson. I guess we could, because it gonna, it's going to take us aside like 10 minutes. Uh, if we take the derivative of this integrand, it's just, giving me the, it's just giving me the inside. Do you remember what notes we did this in? I'm I remember gonna now. Oh, I do you remember? Now. Yeah, I remember now. Okay, so treat the integral and derivative as inverses of each other. You don't have to find it. So sorry that I made you get up there, Miss. All right, so because of that via kana, because the derivative of the integral is f of x, if you take away the ddx, the integral symbol means take the antiderivative. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like a little play on words. The derivative of the integral is the inside, f of x. So if you take away the derivative, that means, me, oh, I got to do antiderivative. Um, how do we feel? Do we feel okay? Okay. So Godinez is telling me that what helped her uh, is saying the derivative of the antiderivative. And notice how they cancel each other out. You're taking the derivative of the antiderivative. Oh, they're canceling each other out. I just get whatever you get left, whatever is inside. That's what you're talking about, right? I like that, miss. Yeah, it's like they're inverses of each other. They really are. All right, guys, uh, can we move on to the next idea of the integral symbol? So before I move on, is everyone okay? Is everyone really solid with the idea that the integral symbol means area under a curve? Okay. Uh, worst case scenario of we're robots, well, you know, I, get, I don't want you to be a robot, but if you take the integral, it just means area. Okay, so now what does it mean? It says, if given a rate like velocity, the expression a to b of v of t dt gives us a displacement. Uh, why? Because if I have a velocity curve in miles per hour, and you're literally just finding 
the error in the curve, miles per hour times hours is just miles. Now, if velocity is positive, you could say that it's distance. But velocity can be positive or negative. So we're going to use the word displacement. Is that okay? So by the way, displacement is just a net change. And really, we're going to use that idea, guys, net change. Net change of what? Net change, and I would put the words distance in quote. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Yes, Godinas is saying, let the units help you out. So anytime you're using, anytime you're finding the area, like anytime you're finding, like, okay, what does it mean? Use the units to help you out. V of T is in miles per hour or meters per second or whatever, whatever it is. And then you're multiplying by your delta T. So meters per hour times hours is just miles. Did I say miles per hour or meters per hour? I already got confused with miles or meters. Uh, if I have meters per second and that my, my time is in seconds, meters per seconds times seconds is meters. If the velocity is always positive or if the velocity is always negative, uh, you are finding your quote unquote distance. Uh, really, it's more correct to say if it's positive because if it's always negative, uh, I guess you're gonna find a negative value which is the magnitude for the distance. Does that make sense, guys? Are we okay? All right, here's an easy problem. It's the same problem from yesterday. Uh, it says a train goes 50 miles per hour for three hours. How many miles does it travel? Well, let's do it with calculus. I know that I'm being complicated. Chavez, you are so complicated right now, Chavez. V of T equals 50. That's my equation. That's my equation. It's just a constant 50 all the time, all the time. If I use calculus, Calculus, zero to three of 50 DX. Really, you can put any letter there. It doesn't really matter. You can put DT if you wanted to. I put T there, so I should probably be putting T. DT. But if you hold your head to the side, a X kind of looks like a T, right? Anyways. <laughs> no, you'd be surprised. We actually do that at the AP reading. Well, at least I do. Because um, <laughs> you don't want to take away a point, you know? At least I don't. Like, no, that T looks like an X. Yeah, it's an X. Here you go. Here you go, buddy. They don't penalize. So before you guys start saying, like, man, they penalize for that, uh, it's a dummy variable. We look away. Uh, but your professor might, might say something. Anyways, antiderivative of 50. 50T, evaluate it from 0 to 3. FTOC, fundamental theorem of calculus, 50 times 3 upper minus lower. 50 times zero. I'm not insulting your intelligence, guys. I know you guys know anything times zero is zero. So you're probably saying, why do you even bother? Uh, I want to show you the steps. 150, put units, miles. I have traveled 150 miles in three hours. Does that make sense, guys? Now, when you guys have kids of your own, if you decide to go that route, uh, and and your and your children are learning about area under curves in fifth grade. Don't teach them the calculus route. Like, oh, I have a rectangle and it's fifty by three. What's the area? Well, well, son or daughter, you got to do the integral or zero. To, yeah, that's, it's overkill, right? Uh, you don't need to do calculus to find the area of simple shapes like rectangles and triangles. All right, how are we feeling so far? Okay. So here's the big deal. So Travis, what's the big deal? Area under the curve from A to B of V of T, DT, we just told you that's displacement. That's the same thing as saying my position at B, upper, minus my position at A, lower. Do you guys agree with that statement? What do you guys think? Do you guys agree with that statement and everything so far? Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. So now look at this, guys. 
what if I told you that I want to find out what position I'm at? Like, I want to know where I'm at at B. I can rewrite all this and write, well, that means X of B can equal to X of A plus the integral from A to B of B of T dt. And look at that. Now I have an equation where I can find any position any at, any, at my B value, my position at B. So what do I need? I just need, this is sometimes called initial, but really you can just say, I just need a given position. And this still means displacement. That still means displacement, it means displacement of the curve. So if I wanna know my position at any time, that's just a time. This is just linear motion. If I wanna know my position at any time B, I can use this equation and it will always give me my position at B. Are we cool guys? Okay, so here's what we tried to do yesterday. And don't worry, we're, we're not gonna freak anyone out. I want you to just observe, just make observations. So let's tw switch the page. And this initially had A, B, C, D, but I wanted to just go over this like within 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes. So I didn't wanna put A, B, C, D in there. A, I think said, what's the acceleration? And then B, I think said like, uh, find the average velocity. And then D, I already forgot what D said. Anyways, you guys can find it later on if you guys wanna look it up. Uh, it says a particle moves along the X axis. So that's velocity V at time T between zero and five is given by this equation. You know how to take the derivative of that equation, but you don't know how to take the antiderivative. That requires more advanced calculus. We're not there yet. Uh, but we. this is a calculator question. Yay, good thing it's a calculator question. So we can use our calculator. Oh, and guess what, Mazuka? You're gonna be very happy. I got that emulator. Yay. I got the free one though. I didn't get the fancy one, but it still gets the job done. <laughs> Cause I didn't want to pay 150 bucks. Next time I'll, I'll, I might pay for it next time, but Right now, uh, right now, right now, things are gonna have to wait. <laughs> Cause I gotta get those tacos. <laughs> no, just, guys, I promise the tacos is not a financial uh, like decision. Like it's gonna be heavy on my pocket. That's nothing. Uh, all right. Anyways, the particle is at position eight at t equals zero. The first thing I would do, guys, I would note that somewhere. Maybe here on the side on the AP exam, I would probably say something like, "This is, by the way, it's moving on the x-axis." So if they tell you you're moving on an axis, I would use that letter. You're moving on the X axis, so my position on the X at time zero is equal to eight. Does everyone know why I wrote X of zero equals eight? At time zero, I'm, at the, I'm on the X axis at the value of eight. So it's just one directional motion. I'm either moving right or I'm moving left. That's it, right or left. Letter C. Find the position of the particle at t equals two. So I'm gonna write x of two here, and I'll put question mark. Well, Chavez just gave me a formula. Chavez gave me this formula, x of b equals x of a plus integral from a to b of b of t. Not that I want you to memorize formulas, guys. I'm not trying to make you to memorize formulas. Matter of fact, it's the opposite. I do not want you to memorize formulas. But these type of questions, Usually you can write them the same way all the time because they're that basic. I wanna know my position at two. All I'm doing is looking up here, guys. All I'm doing is looking up there. So look, my position at two, so that's what I wanna know, X of B, is equal to, and it says I gotta have a position initial or something given. They did, it's not always zero. As you saw yesterday, yesterday everyone was freaking out when they gave me X of eight or something. This time they gave me zero, so I'm gonna write, x of zero, and then I go plus integral. So if this says zero, I better have my lower limit be zero. And then what do I want it at? I want it at two, so I better have my upper limit be two. And then I write v of t dt. How do we feel right now? Okay, everyone grab your calculator. I'm gonna take out, I have a TI-84 with me today. Uh, if you have a TI Inspire, you can use that. Uh, later on, I'll use the Inspires, but right now I'm gonna use the TI-84. And so here we go, I'm gonna take it out and I'm gonna share my screen where everyone can see everything. 
Mazuka, can you see my calculator? Yes. Yay. I'm going to click on. <laughs> Why isn't it turning on? There we go. It is now on. <laughs> I'm going to go to Y equals. And I'm going to type that LN. LN. Hold on, guys. LN of X squared. Minus 3x. And it's taking a while. I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to mess with the settings here. It was working earlier. I wonder if it's if it's working harder because it's connected to Zoom now and everything. Minus three x plus three. How do you get letters? Oh, the button is on top of the apps. Do you see the apps button? Uh, Next yes. to the alpha. Push that button. It says X, T, theta, and N. That stands for in your independent variables, depending on what mode you're in. Okay. I'm going to use my mouse, see if my mouse works better with this. Okay, so now from there, I noticed that I typed it in Y1. I'm going to go to my home screen. Yeah, my mouse works way better with this. So on my home screen, here's what I'm gonna type. I'm gonna type my initial, x0, which is eight, eight, plus I click on math and I go to integral, number nine. And there it is, I have an integral symbol. I'm gonna push zero, I'm gonna push two. And you can, if you want, in there, inside, push ln of t squared minus three t plus three. But I'm telling you, this way like this, you'll never make a mistake, as long as you don't make a mistake on the y equals. I'm gonna call the y. How do I do that? Push the alpha button, push the trace button, and there it is. You have a list of all the y values, and push enter. Since I have it in Y1, that's where I have my Y1, and then I just type push the X, which is next to the alpha, and I'm gonna push enter. I'm gonna need a slower walkthrough. <laughs> yes. All right, you want me, you wanna, oh wait, uh, yeah. So do you want me to start from scratch? I know, I have the line plotted for Y1. Oh, you, okay. Don't You don't have to even worry about plotting it. So you're right here at Y equals. Right? Yes, yeah, I mean, okay. yeah, I mean, I want equal to that. Go to your home screen. So how do you do that? You just push second quit. And I'm going to start again, guys. Okay. Are you at your home screen? Yes. Okay. Now, let, what was my, I'm doing this where it says X naught. What was my X naught or your initial time or your initial value? Sorry. Eight. So I put eight and the eight is found right on top of the five. I, I'm trying to be funny, guys, but maybe that comes across as being rude. I don't know. Uh, there it is. And then I push plus, and I'm going to – got to have some fun, right? I'm going to push math, and I'm just going to find the word integral, number nine. And then I'm going to put my limits. In the bottom, I just type the number zero. And then on the top, I push two. And then inside, you can write all this if you want, ln of t squared minus 3t plus 3. But since you already wrote it in y1, call y1. How do you do that? Push the green button. On mine, it's green. It says alpha. And then push the trace. Alpha, trace. And you're going to get a list. Do you see that list? And then just choose the one that you want. I want y1, so I'm just going to push enter. And then at the bottom, at the back, where it says d, is there's a rectangle. Push x again, which is next to the alpha letter. And now push enter. All right, I got it. <laughs> and that's what we're going to be doing over and over again. So x of 2 is equal to, uh, did it, does it revert back to what I, let me go back to, x of 2 is equal to, uh, what was the value? 3686. Six. Minimum, minimum three digits after the decimal. Always, which is actually what's a thousandth place minimum. Can you put more? Yes, yes you can always put more. As a matter of fact, uh, I would write every digit all the time. Not all of them, but you know, I would probably write four digits all the time, four or five. 
it doesn't matter. It could be rounded or truncated. You could have said three, six, nine, or you could have said three, six, eight. They accept both. If you were to look up this exam, you would probably see both answers in there. Did we understand letter C, guys, for this one? All right. Let's keep going. Now let's see if we can connect it. So yesterday, everyone was freaking out. Okay, let me just go ahead and write first what we just did right now. We did this. X of B is equal to X of A plus integral from A to B of velocity. Yesterday, everyone was freaking out when I wanted values of F. I wanted values of, don't write this down, just listen, guys. I wanted value at zero, I wanted a value at one, I wanted a value at two, and so on and so forth. I don't remember. There were some numbers. We wanted values at, at all over the place, like five different ones. And everyone was like, Chavez, I've never seen this. I don't know how to do it. I can't, I can't, I can't. Okay, let's slow down. What is from A to B? Notice that you, we just did this a little while ago. And I'm going to type in F prime of X DX. What is the antiderivative of F prime? Yeah, just F. Just F, guys. That's the same thing we did with velocity. We have the antiderivative of velocity's position, and then you just, you just put upper minus lower. So this just means antiderivative evaluated at the top minus antiderivative evaluated at the bottom. Do you see what I did there? Do you see the connection that I'm trying to make? I'm going to make this one look exactly like the one on the top. You can already see what I'm going to do. I'm going to move the f of a to the left, but then I'm going to write it on the right-hand side because I want the f of b on the left. So I'm going to rewrite this. I'm going to write f of b is equal to f of a plus integral from a to b of f prime of x dx. Remember, guys, on this top one, this stood for displacement, which we said is like net change in distance. Well, on this one down here, this is the exact same thing, guys. It doesn't stand for displacement this time because I'm calling it F prime. So instead of calling it displacement, I'm going to call this, this will tell me the net change of F. Because that's what this is. That's what this is up here in blue. That's just your change in Y values, right? Whenever, Travis, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, whenever we you had algebra one or algebra two, then we say that was change in y over change in x. That was slope. Don't write this down. Just listen. And so we said f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Well, that's the same thing. That's just slope. The change in y's. So this you can think of this as net change of f. You can also say change in y. See, it's how much your Y's value moves, how much your F moves. Does that make sense, guys, to you guys? Mazuka, what do you think? What are you thinking? I think it makes sense. Okay, does it make sense to everyone, though? Lanford, Ochoa, future engineer. So now is all this coming back and coming back into place? So do we see what we're, we're, what we're dealing with? All right, so all right, guys, I'm gonna give you guys 30 seconds to go back to notes 34. Oh no, the notes I don't wanna see. <laughs> so I'll give you guys some time to get them. Yeah, you did. Huh. Does everyone have their notes? All right, look at this question from 2013, question four. 
before we begin, and I'm going to erase a whole bunch of stuff that we have here. Before we begin, does everyone understand what graph they're looking at? What graph is this? Is this F or is this F prime? F prime. F prime, the derivative. They're giving us a derivative. So let's read this again, and then let's go to letter B after we read it. The figure above shows the graph of F prime, the derivative of a twice differential function F on the closed interval zero to eight. The graph of F prime has horizontal tangents at one, three, and five. And I have a habit, as soon as I see that, I like to put little segments of horizontal tangents, if you guys wanna do that as well. So those are the only ones that are horizontal. You do not have a horizontal at eight. So don't even think about drawing one there. That's it, those are the only three they're telling us. The areas of the regions between the graph of F prime and the X axis are labeled in the figure. Oh yeah, yeah, they labeled them very nice. Notice, man, they're being very extra. Notice they even put the word area in there to make sure that you are not confused that that seven does not mean anything else besides the area of that one region. So I think they're being extra. They're just being very cautious, which is fine. The function F is defined for all row numbers and satisfies, and look at that, that is a beauty. Circle that guys. They are giving us a position of eight. It's like it's like same position in, in uh, for particle motion. They are telling us that when the x value is eight for f, the y value is four. Okay, now that we know that, let's go to letter B. Determine the absolute minimum value of f on the closed interval zero to eight, justify your answer. The justification for this, the best justification is always a table. The best justification is always a table. Now I did look this question up yesterday after we were done and they almost made a table. They literally just wrote out all of them, uh, but it's like a table. Uh, I still like my table idea. So I'm gonna write X and I'm gonna write F of X. When you're making your table, the values that you want, you want two types of values. You are always going to put your endpoints, always, 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 because you're in a closed interval. And you're, and then after the endpoints, what else do I want? It starts with letter C. Second letter R. Critical points. Yeah, I want my critical points. What's a critical point? Where the derivative is zero, or undefined. So here we go, my endpoint zero, and then all my critical points. I have a critical point at one, put that in there, one. I have a critical point, one, two, three. I have a critical point at four, put that in there, four. Four, five, I have another one at six. And then your endpoint, eight. Are we okay so far? If you want the values, they gotta give you at least one reference. We usually call it initial, but it's not, initial I think has been synonymous for zero. So I don't wanna use the word initial anymore. Uh, do they give me at least one value? When X is something, I have a value for F? They do. What, at what value do they give me? Do they give me the zero one or what, are they, what do they give me again? Eight. Yeah, they give me the value when x is eight. When x is eight, the f value is four. So let's come up with an equation. How do I figure out, we're gonna go backwards. How do I figure it out at six? So I'm gonna write f of six is equal to, what do they give me? They give me the one at eight, f of eight. And then look at your notes, the ones that we just did a little while ago. I push a plus. And then what do I write? I write the integral. What number do I put down here? The eight. And the number that I put on the top is the one that I want. I want I wanted a six there, so I put a six up there. There we go, and I put f prime of x. There it is. I have f prime of x up here. There it is right here. Now, before you put a number in there, guys, so here we go. I'm gonna say f of six is equal to 
Let's see, f of a, that's definitely four. Plus, before you put a number, recognize that you are going backwards on your integral symbol. You're starting at eight and ending at six. So because you're going backwards, instead of saying that area is positive, which it is, it's a positive area because it's above the x-axis. But instead of saying the number seven, we're gonna say what? Don't be scared, guys. Yeah, negative seven. Thank you, miss. Don't be scared, guys, please. I need to make sure that you guys know what's up. That's a negative seven there. What is four plus negative seven? Five, six, seven. Negative three. We can do that, guys. Come on. We can do that. that this is no calculator. So we can at least do that. So plug in a negative three at six. Okay, now I know what f of six is. Now I wanna figure out what f of four is. So I come back and I write f of four equals, I already know where I'm at at six, so I'm gonna write f of six plus integral from six, what do I want now? Four of f prime of x. Again, f of six is negative three, plus I look at between six and four. You're counting backwards, between six and four is that semicircle, and that, well, it's not really quite a semicircle, but it looks like one, but it's not. And they tell me that the area is three. It, it should be negative three, right? But I'm counting backwards, so because you're counting backwards, instead of negative three, you're gonna say what? Someone else besides Aleman. Plus three. Positive three, so plus three. So negative three plus three. That is a zero, and that's what I'm gonna type right there, zero. So that's what your f of four is. And I'm gonna keep going, guys. If you're running out of space, go to the next page or something. So here we go, f of one equals f of four. By the way, you don't even have to say f of four. You know what, I want you guys to see this. I'm gonna go ahead and type f of eight, cause that's what they give me. f of eight plus the integral from eight all the way to one of f prime of x. It just builds up, guys. You don't have to start where you don't want to start. You can always start f of eight is just four plus, let's see what I've done so far. Uh, negative seven plus three, and there's one more region. Uh, from four all the way to one, that area is six. So I can just go minus six right there like that. Do you see what I did there, guys? Is it making sense? I hope it is. Uh, minus six, so it's gonna be a negative six there. Last one. Let's see if we can do it without the the without uh, writing an equation. So I'm a negative six, and then the area between one and zero is two. So because it's positive there, I'm gonna be subtracting. So then I'm gonna write negative eight. Does everyone see where I got negative eight? Be honest. Okay. Can you repeat that again? Yes. Uh, you see this right here, Deenan? They tell me, well, it's kind of fuzzy now. Let me wait till this, there we go. They tell me that this area here is two, but I'm counting backwards. I'm going from one to zero. So because I'm going from one to zero, this area here is gonna be, you're gonna call it, we're gonna say minus two. So we're gonna take our last value that we had, negative six, and we subtract two, so negative eight. Cool? Okay, now looking at all that data, that table, where do I have, what is my absolute minimum value of F? Notice I say the word value. What is it? What's the, remember in math, the minimum value is the one that's furthest left on the number line. So it works a little different than physics. What's the smallest value there, guys? The negative eight. The negative eight. The negative eight, guys. And then just make a statement. You don't have, do not write an essay. Just write one sentence. I'm going to say absolute minimum. I didn't even spell minimum right. Absolute minimum value, they're not gonna take away for spelling, but try to spell words that are at least in the literature, the same as the literature words. 
absolute minimum value of negative eight and it occurs, I should over the word it, right? But this is fine. And it occurs at x equals zero. And I would make sure that it says f somewhere. Absolute minimum value of negative eight, absolute minimum f, f has an absolute minimum value of negative eight and it occurs at x equals zero. Done. Full credit. All right, can we go to the next one, guys? I love, love, love letter C. I'm loving it. Uh, I shouldn't use that word because it's uh, McDonald's, right? It's They're going to come and take my video down because they want to monetize on. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding, guys. <laughs> no one cares about my little channel with very few people in it. Uh, what open interval containing uh, contained between 0 and 8 is the graph of f concave down and increasing. So now they're just testing to see if you know basic definitions, guys. When is f down? Just tell me definitions. When is the graph of f concave down? When what happens? Tiff, hook me up, Tiff. When is con when is graph of f concave down? Not for this one. Just tell me the definition. Um, when f prime prime is negative. Perfect. Thank you, Miss. When f prime prime is negative. So I'm gonna I don't write this down. Well, I guess for notes, write it down. But I would not write this down on the AP exam. I'm gonna say f prime prime negative. When is f increasing? Got it on. Help me out on this one, miss. When does F increase? F prime is positive. Perfect. Those are definitions. Uh, I would not write it like this. So how would I write it? So here's what I'm looking for. I'm looking where the, for where the second derivative is negative, but F prime is positive. So let's look at our graph. Do not look at anything below the X axis. I need F prime to be positive. So look at everything above the x-axis. Are we okay? Now, where is F prime prime negative? Well, this is F prime. So the rule still apply. If F prime prime is negative, tell me that what that means about F prime. F prime is decreasing. Perfect. Yes, yas, yas, yas. F prime is decreasing. So look at this graph, F prime above the x-axis, but decreasing. Where does that happen? I'm gonna put it in green here. So tell me where F prime is positive above the x-axis, but decreasing. From what to what? Zero to one. Zero to one is one of them, perfect. Give me another one. Three to four. Three to four, and I'm highlighting it here in green. And I don't see any more. Do you guys see any more? There it is. We got it. Perfect. I come back. And this, we're going to use parentheses. And I bet you this is going to be full credit. Here's how you write it. Do not write an essay. Just write one, maybe two sentences. I'm going to write F is both concave down and increasing. on the intervals, zero to one, and I already forgot the other one, uh, three to four, and three to four. Since, since what? Since F prime is positive and decreasing on these, specific intervals. Here's where you want to avoid saying the word it, since it is decreasing and, and positive. Do not say the word it, say F prime specifically. F is both concave down and increasing on the interval zero to one and three to four, since F prime is positive and decreasing on these specific intervals. Done, perfect. 
In a little bit, we'll look at the rubric, see if we got all the points. How do we feel? F. They, no, they gave us the F prime graph. Oh, yes. Uh, it's always best to reference the graph that they give you. So by saying F prime is decreasing, you're literally saying F prime prime is negative. Does that make sense? So Godina's asked a question. She said uh, that I reference F prime positive and decreasing because that, that's the graph they gave me. So yes, you usually want to reference the graph that they give you. You would still be right if you said F prime is positive and F prime prime is decreasing, you would still be right. I'm sorry, F prime prime is negative. Sorry, that's what I meant to say. F prime is positive and F prime prime is negative. You would still be right, but this is the best one right here. F prime is positive and decreasing because you're referencing the graph. All right, one more, guys. And then we'll see if you guys feel like you have enough energy. The function G is defined. G of X equals F of X to the third power. If F of three equals negative five halves, find the slope of the of the line tangent to the graph of g at x equals three. Okay, what are they asking me to do here? Just like well, find slope, Travis. Okay, yeah, I get it. Uh, what does it mean though? They want me to take a what? What do they want me to do, Lanford? They want me to take a what? Derivative. Yeah, they want me to take a derivative. Derivative of what? Uh, g of x? Yep, they want me to take a derivative of g. They're trying to see if I know how to do it. What rule do I gotta use for this, guys? Yeah, chain rule, guys. Just plain old-fashioned chain rule. Here we go. G prime of x is equal to derivative of the outside. Three, leave the inside alone. F of x, close, close, put a square on it, times derivative of the inside. F prime of x. I have everything. Chavez, no, you don't. Yeah, you do. We have everything. G prime of three is equal to three times F of three. I'm just plugging in a three everywhere times f prime of three. On the side, they tell me what f of three is, so that's f of three. And I know f prime of three, how do I know f prime of three? Well, I have the graph of f prime, so I just go back to my graph, and oh look, they're even, they're even really nice to me, and they tell me that when x is three on this f prime graph, that the y value is four. So f prime of three is four. Tengo todo. I have everything I need. All I need is myself. I just plug in, guys. No calculator. If you are paranoid, I, I, I want you guys to solve it. But if you are paranoid on the day of the AP exam, can you leave it like that for full credit? Yes. Everything is in terms of numbers. As long as everything has a number in it, there's no variables anywhere. You can leave it alone. I want you guys to keep going. Don't be scared. Three times negative five, to, negative times the negative is a positive. So that's gonna be 25 over four times four. Oh, look at that. The fours cancel out. What's 25 times three? Not everyone at the same time. How are we feeling, guys? Okay, so you guys tell me, do you guys have enough energy to tackle one more? Or do you guys wanna call it a day and then I'll edit the Delta Math and you can, uh, if you didn't start it yesterday, you can start it today and all that good stuff. All right, guys, so yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we're continuing yesterday's notes. Um, it's from the 2019 AP exam. And it's calculator active. So you're gonna need a calculator, so take out your calculator, guys. Oh, why, what does that mean? <laughs> All right, so here we go, guys. Uh, so first they give us a table. The table has T in hours and V of P, which stands for velocity, and it has a subscript of P, so uh, uh, that just stands for particle P here. And let's read this and see what's going on. And I know it says y'all lead on this one because the deal was that on Wednesday you guys were gonna lead on this one, but I don't even think we reached it. We didn't reach this question until today, which is two days later, uh, which is okay, which is okay. All right, 
the velocity of a particle p moving along the x-axis is given by the differentiable function v of p, where v of p is measured in meters per hour and t is measured in hours. Okay, fair enough. Selected values of velocity of this particle are shown in the table above. Particle P is at the origin at time T equals zero. Okay, that's good to know. So I start at zero, so zero, zero. Letter A, justify why there must be at least one time between 0.3 and 2.8 at which V prime of P or V prime, the acceleration of particle P equals zero meters per hour. Guys, they are screaming at you. They are screaming at you. They're not screaming the way your mom screams at you, but they're screaming at you to look at 0.3 and to look at 2.8. I want you to recognize that at 0.3, I have 55, and at 2.8, I have 55. If I just do just the basic average rate of change of just algebra, you're going to find that you have a slope of zero. Does that make sense to everyone? Perfect. So here's what I'm going to write. I'm going to write down first. I'm going to go V of P of 2.8 minus V of P of 0 0.3. And if you have a little bit of physics background, you will know that you are finding the average acceleration between 0.3 and 2.8. And then I would write, okay, V of P of 2.8 is 55. And then V of P of 0.3 is 55. And 2.8 minus 0.3, that is 2.5. And I have 0 divided by 2.5, and all that equals 0. And I need units, and this is, let's see, meters per hour per hour. Meters per hour per hour. All right, we still have not justified. we got to write a sentence. What theorem am I going to use to prove this one? I don't know, Travis. MVT? Yeah, MVT. MVT, guys. I'm going to state that velocity is differentiable because it tells me right there. So because it's differentiable, I know I'm continuous. I'm going to write velocity is differentiable and continuous. Or you can really say for all values of t, but uh, I guess if you want to be specific, you can say on that specific interval. I'm just going to leave it like that. Velocity is differentiable and continuous, comma. Therefore, comma, by MVT, comma, V prime subscript of P of t must equal zero for some time or for some t value. Uh, let's see, for some t value between t equals 0 0.3 and t equals 2.8. You probably could have said it better, guys. You probably could have done like t between 0.3 and 0.8, 2.8, like this, but I didn't. I think this is full credit. Velocity is differentiable and continuous, therefore by MVT. V prime of t equals zero for some t value between 0.3 and 2.8. And they can see that the average rate of change between 2.8 and 3 is a zero. That's that first line. Full credit. What's up? Oh, IVT is intermediate value theorem. It's just something between something and something. This is a rate of change. So the MVT is uh, F prime of C is equal to F of B minus F of A over B minus A. And IVT is just that you're, if you're a continuous function, that you're crossing that value between A and B. But I'm not crossing anything. It's just, I mean, unless I had acceleration values on the bottom and they told me negative one, zero, one, or they didn't even have to mention zero, negative one to one, then I can use IVT that acceleration has to be zero because they gave me accelerations. Yes, if there were, so the question is, why can't I use intermediate value theorem? And we can't use IVT on this one because they don't give us A of T. 
if they would have given us acceleration and they would have said one at one time it's negative one and at the other time it's one, then we could have used IVT. If they would have asked, prove that velocity is zero, velocity is definitely zero sometime because I see that I am negative 29 there. So sometime between 0.3 and 1.7, velocity had to be zero. That's if you're using the IVT. Does that make sense, guys? Did I answer your question? Okay. I think we're good. So let's see what letter B says. Use a trapezoidal sum with three subintervals to approximate the value of this guy. Okay, so the first trapezoid is between zero and 0 0.3. Here's the second, here's the third. So let's, uh, I'm gonna zoom out so I can see my table here. So the first trapezoid has a height of 0.3. So I'm gonna write equals 0 0.3. And then the first base is a zero, the second base is a 55, and then divided by two. Plus, the second trapezoid has a height, let's see, 1.7 minus 0.3, one, two, three. I think that's a 1.4. The first trapezoid has a 55 as the base, and I know that this is gonna sound weird, but it's negative 29. So you're going, yeah, it's going down there. And all that divided by two. All I'm doing, guys, is the area for a trapezoid. Base one plus base two divided by two times height. Plus, so the third one, the third one is the difference between 1.7 and 2.8. So that is going to be a 1.1, 1.1. And then I'm going to write negative 29 plus 55. Close it, divided by two. And you can actually leave it like that. Uh, I don't recommend it. Why do I not recommend it on this one? Do we have a calculator? We have a calculator. On the calculator section, you can actually do it like that, and that's actually correct. They won't take away points. Uh, but because we have a calculator, guys, I would just use your calculator. So let me use my calculator here. I'm going to take it out. Um, And let me put it here so you guys can see what I'm doing. All right, so here we go. Here's my little calculator. Hopefully you guys can see that. And I'm just gonna type it in, guys. 0.3, parenthesis, 55, close it, divided by two, plus, and there is a way to format it to look exactly like this, but I'm pretty sure I'm safe right here. 1.4, parenthesis, 55, plus a negative 29, close it, divided by two, plus 1.1, open, negative 29, plus 55, close it, divided by two. And let's see what I get. I get 40.75. So there it is. Hopefully you guys got that too. And let me go back to just uh, this guy. 40.75. And my units are meters. Is this, okay, here comes the big question. Is this distance or is this displacement? Which one is it, guys? Distance or displacement? Can you tell? I don't know, Travis. I can't tell. I think it's displacement. Why do you think it's displacement, Mazuka? Because at 1.7, you have a negative velocity. So that means you're traveling in like the opposite direction for some Perfect. Way. Perfecto. Excelente. I can't speak French, so I, I can't say any of those French words in French. But exactly, guys, you have velocities that are both positive and negative. So because you have velocities that are, both, that are both positive and negative, this has to be displacement. Because you know for a fact you are moving to the left at some interval between 0 and 4. Because there's a negative 29 in there. Cool or not cool? So this particle definitely has a change in direction. It, it changes direction twice. Might it change direction more than twice? Maybe, we don't know that. It could change direction more than twice, but it definitely changed direction somewhere between 0.3 and 1.7.
and it definitely changed directions one more time between 1.7 and 2.8. So that might be a future question. They might ask you, they might ask you, how many times does this particle at minimum change directions? At minimum, it changes directions twice. Does it change more? Maybe, we don't know, but it definitely at minimum changes direction twice. So this is displacement. This is displacement. Because I know that particle P started at zero, I know that at 2.8, particle P is at 4.75. If there was such a thing as a mile marker or a meter marker uh, on the x-axis, it's at 40.75 at t equals 2.8, approximately. Are we cool? All right, let's go to the next question, guys. All right, let's read this one together. A second particle Q also moves along the x-axis. Oh, okay. So as, uh, so as velocity between zero and four is given by, and they give you a velocity equation, meters per hour. Find the time interval. Oh, okay, they want an interval, interesting. During which the velocity of particle Q is at least, is at least 60 meters per hour. Find the distance traveled by particle Q during the interval when the velocity of particle Q is at least 60 meters per hour. I haven't done this question, guys, but it gives me it gives me a big hint. Well, okay, that's a lie. I did this question in 2019, but it's been a while. I can't remember it. Uh, it's giving me hints that this particle goes faster than 60 meters per hour because it says the word least, and it says that I want a time interval. So that means there's probably an interval that I'm going at least 60 miles an hour or 60 meters per hour. So what you want to do... You want to do this. You want to equal that to 60. Do not bother trying to do this algebraically. You have a calculator, so don't even think about doing this algebraically. You're going to waste too much time. Is everyone okay with what I'm doing right here with what that first statement says? That first statement says I want the equation for velocity to equal 60. As soon as you do that, I'm going to give time intervals. So here we go. And use the exact. Don't round. So I'm going to take my calculator. I'm going to show everyone how to do it. Uh, I'm going to take my calculator. So let me get my calculator up front. Where are you, calculator? There we go. And I'm going to move it right here. So let me share screen. Can everyone see my calculator? Perfect. So here we go. Go to y equals. Oh, I turned it off by accident. And I'm going to type in this equation. 45 square root of x, and then get out of there. And then I'm just going to go cosine of 0 0.063 x squared. Close it. Did everyone do that on y1? On y2, type in 60. Don't push graph yet. Go to window. I'm only looking between zero and four. Why? Because they tell me up here, it says between zero and four. So X min zero, X max four. X scale, that's fine, go by one, no big deal. Y min, well, uh, I know that I'm not looking for any negative values uh, because it wants me to be at 60 meters. So I'm gonna put Y min at zero because I want to keep the scale, I want to see, and why max? I'm going to go all the way to 100. I do not know how high this goes. Actually, maybe we do. Let's see, 45. No, I don't. Not off the top of my head. Um, square root of, okay, I do know. Square root of 4 is 2. 45 times 2 is 90. This goes all the way to 90. Sorry, guys. That took longer than necessary. And your Y scale, if you don't mind being all bunched up, you can leave it as 1, but I do mind, so I'm going to put 10. You don't have to. You don't have to. You can just push graph now. And now look, boom, there it is. You see those two intersections? I don't know if you guys can see my mouse there. I'm going to find those. You do not have to do anything by hand. Tell the calculator to do all the work. We're in 2021. Second, calculate, and then look for something that says intersect. Number five on mine. So I'm going to push number five. It says first curve. Yeah, the first curve, you're fine. Enter. Second curve is telling me that it's that linear line. Well, I only have two curves in there, so that's fine. It says guess. The reason why it says guess is because if there are more than two of them, well, if there are more than one of them, 
uh, you move the cursor to the one you want. This one's already close to the left-hand side, so I'm just going to move it a little more to the left and push Enter, and it's going to give me that one. You see that 1.8661815? That's one of them. I'm going to write it immediately down here. T equals, and I already lost it. Uh, Gondinus, can you hook me up? One point. You always want to write the most digits as possible. I like to go down the alphabet. Sometimes College Board, the rubric has the same thing. Sometimes they don't. I'm going to store this to A. And I just put an arrow, and I just put store it to A. I'm going to find the other value. So let me take up my calculator again. So share. Oh, hold on. i got to bring the calculator up first and then share it. OK. So there we go. Now, can everyone see the calculator? I'm going to do the same thing. Second, calculate number five. Try it out, guys, because that's the only way we're going to get better. And then first curve, second curve, there's only two curves. Just push enter twice. One, two. And then when it says guess, don't push enter a third time. Move the cursor to the one you want. I want the one over there on the right-hand side. It just has to be close to it. You don't have to get right on it. And then push enter. If it still says guess, you haven't gotten the answer, push enter. Boom, there it is. Make sure that the Y value says 60. I get 3.5191744. Let me see if I can remember that. 3.51, nope, I cannot remember that. <laughs> Hook me up. 5191744. And I'm going to store that. Guess what letter I'm going to use? B. I just go down the alphabet all the time. Okay, I got my T values. Look what it says, find the distance traveled. They probably will not penalize you. I didn't grade this question, so I don't know, but I'm pretty sure they didn't. They probably will not penalize you if you just write V of Q in the integral because the velocity is positive. And I saw that, I saw that in my graph, it's above the x-axis, but I would still advise to put the absolute value since it says the word distance. I'm gonna put A, I'm gonna put B, and make sure you got to have it in the work somewhere to tell the authors that you know what A and B are. A is a 1.866. I put an arrow to the A. And the B is a 3.519. And I put an arrow to the B. You can also use equal signs if you don't like the arrows. And then I'm going to write. You can either write the expression or you can write what? V of Q. You must put, if you're, if you're going to live dangerous, V of Q, you can put T in there. If you're going to live dangerous, you got to put that Q. If you do not put the Q, do you get the credit for the integral? No, because if you don't put the Q, they don't know what velocity you're talking about. Which one is it? Even if you have the right answer, which indicates you did the right thing, you will not get the integral point. So... Either write that, or if you feel like, no, I'm just going to write the whole expression just to be safe. You can write the whole expression in there. 45 squared of t cosine 0 0.063 t squared. There it is. I'm going to put equal sign. You do not have to do anything by hand. Tell the calculator to do it. Here we go, guys. Oh, I forgot to give to tell you how to. Okay. Okay, I'm about to. How do we store it in a graph? Well, let's tell you. Can everyone see my calculator? Okay, at the moment, I have that 3.5191. Here's how you store it on a graph. That means at the moment, these are called registers in the programming world, if you're a programmer. At the moment, it's saved in the memory for the X register of 3.519. So go to your home screen, second, quit. On your home screen, if you push the letter X, look what happens, X and enter. Is that the value that we just had a little while ago? It is. Push the store button. It's on the left-hand side next to the, between the four and the one. And it's going to say answer. And this one was alphabetical letter B. So there it is. I put it in letter B. I don't have my A, so I'm going to go back and I'm going to find the intersection again and store it in A. I should have done that earlier, so sorry, guys. I'm going to push the graph button. Here's my graph. Second, calculate number five. And I'm going to go first curve, enter, enter, and it says guess. I'm just going to scroll to the one I want. Enter. There it is. 1.866. I'm going to store this to A. So how do I do that? Second, quit. It should be immediately on the X. Uh, push X. There it is. And I'm going to store it. 
Store it, alpha A. And I know, okay, I'll slow down. I know some of you are thinking, well, if it's already X, can't I just do the integral and then just type in lower limit X, upper limit B? Guys, X is the last variable you wanna use at, for, your, for anything other than, you know, in your integral when you're typing to the DX. Do not use the X, store, it some, store those numbers elsewhere. Here we go, math. INT, number nine in this one, and you have everything stored in the calculator, so there's no way for you to mess up. Alpha A in the bottom, alpha B in the top. So catch up to there. In here, you already have it saved. Don't you already have it saved in Y1? How do I get Y1 in here? Someone give me the directions. Hmm. How do I get Y1 in there, guys? Isn't it um, alpha trace? Yes, it is, miss. Alpha trace, you get a list of Y values. There it is, Y1, push enter. And there it is. That's it, guys. You're pretty much done. All you got to do is give this guy a little letter and put the X in there. Enter, done. There's my answer. Oh, by the way, I forgot to put absolute value. It doesn't matter. It's going to be the same value, guys. Uh, what was the calculator answer? 106.108. I need at least three digits. 108.75. All right, I'm going to put absolute value, guys, just to show you. So let me take out the calculator again. Where is the absolute value located at? So let me show you where it's at. First, I'm going to put the integral symbol again so we can practice makes perfect, guys. Math, number nine. I already know it's number nine. Alpha A, I still haven't changed A, so A is still A. Alpha B, B is still B. And when you come in here, I'm going to put absolute value. Chavez, how do you get that? You push math, and you go to the second column that says number, N-U-M, and it's going to be the very first one. It says ABS. ABS stands for absolute. I push enter. And look, they give you two lines. And then I go alpha, trace again, and I put Y1. And then I go to this guy, and I put an X. Now, unless I am so bad, it better be the same number. I realize the velocities were positive. It's going to be the same. And if it's not the same, I'm not going to heaven. But I know it's going to be the same, so I'm going to go to heaven. See, I went to heaven. Heck yeah. I, I live dangerous, guys. Nah, I, it was going to be, I knew it was going to be the same. So there it is. I think on this one, I think, don't quote me. I think on this one, if you would not have put the absolute values, I think you would have been forgiven. Because I think authors would be like, well, they understand that the velocity is positive. Are we still okay, guys? Okay, I have an issue with my calculator. All right, um, what's happening? I can't even graph it. It says that there's an error like invalid dimension oh okay click on window okay invalid dimensions means that your window does not work like you don't have this correct uh you have probably like four for x min and zero for x max or something so type this in and it'll work let me see i have zero four one zero ninety ten um it looks like i have everything do you have x resolution oh it doesn't matter for that push graph again okay yeah, it says invalid. Uh, go to your y equals. Was it working earlier? No, I don't think I've ever been able to graph. Like, I tried graphing yesterday, and it was also giving me that. Okay, so check that your x is like that by itself, 45 squared of x, and then cosine 0 0.063 x squared. Yes, I think so, yeah. And then on y2, do you have 60? Yes. And it still doesn't graph? Mm -hmm. Okay, stay uh, when uh, stay here uh, once class is dismissed, and we will uh, aim your calculator at the camera, and we will troubleshoot it. Uh, okay. Should be pretty easy fix. Is that cool, Miss? Yes. Okay. All right, guys. Let's go to this last one here. At time t equals zero, particle q is at position negative ninety. Oh, okay. So I'm gonna write x of q at zero is negative 90. Using the result from part B and the function V of Q from part C, 
approximate the distance between particle P and Q. Hey, wait a minute. I thought, oh, okay, particle P started in the origin. Got it. Particle P initially started at the origin, if I remember correctly. They want to know, look at this. This question keeps popping up over and over again. They want to know where X of Q is at 2.8 and where, well, they don't directly want to know. They want to know where particle P is at 2.8. And they're not asking for where are they at. They're asking for the what? The distance between them. So I'm going to find these values. And then I'm going to I'm going to subtract the difference to see where how far they are apart. Does that make sense to you guys? All right. So let's see which one are we going to do first. Let's do the Q one first since we just been working on that one recently. So it says at time zero, the particle is at negative 90. So I put negative 90. I'm going to go plus integral from zero all the way to 2.8 of velocity of Q. And I'm going to see what that is. So let me take out my calculator. Hey, Amita. So I'm going to take out my calculator. Here we go, guys. I'm going to push a little rabbit symbol and then push. Yeah, there's a little rabbit. All right, here it is, guys. Here's my little calculator. And here we go. I'm going to type negative 90 plus, come on, buddy, and then math number nine. And then I'm going to go from zero, not from A this time, from zero, all the way to 2.8. And I already have it in my Y1, so alpha trace Y1 dx. Enter. It's thinking. It's fine for it to think. There it is, guys. 45.9376. Did you get the same thing? Okay, so I'm going to write that down, 45.9376. Oh, thank you, miss. <laughs> Give me more digits. Can I have more digits on this one? 9376535. Use the exact. All right, here we go on the next one. The next one is just, actually, the next one, I think we can just steal it right from B. Yeah, we can just steal it. Look, we said this was the displacement. But because I started at the origin, I can just write 40.75. Does everyone know why I wrote 40.75? Yeah, it, it literally said that I started at the origin and that to use the position of B. By the way, if you're thinking like, man, Chavez, what if I get B wrong? Will I be able to get letter D correct? Yes, we grade with you. So we'll count letter B wrong. But let's say it was an honest mistake. Let's say you put 50.75 and we'll continue to grade and we'll just take the difference between 45 and 50.75 and give you that answer and give you that point. Okay, so now I'm just gonna take my calculator, which I already have, let me bring it up. Uh, click on the little rabbit and then click on this. And there's my answer and I'm just gonna go minus 40.75. I'm going to push enter. There's the distance. 5.187 or 5.188. I bet you they'll take both. I'm going to write uh, distance between particle P and Q. Distance between particle P and Q at T equals 2.8 seconds or 2.8 is, and I already forgot the number. <laughs> Well, was it 5.1876? And they don't give you units. I don't think I saw any units anywhere. Oh, yeah, never mind. Meters. Meters. Done. I am actually curious. I really want to see the rubric on this one. Do you guys want to see the rubric? What's up? Uh, it wanted my time intervals. Yeah, I would, I think this would be full credit, but I think if you want to be like a hundred percent sure you could do this, it's 60 between 1.866 and 3.519, or you could say 1.866 comma 
3.519 on the side somewhere. So Godina said uh, it won at the time interval. Find the time interval during which the velocity of the particle Q is 60 meters per hour. Okay. I think because it says find, I think it would be best if you did this. But I think they would still give you the credit. I think they would still give you the credit. When to write the what? Oh, uh, you can write a sentence all the time. Uh, it's just that sometimes I have a habit of not writing it. You can always write, you can say, find the distance traveled by particle Q, and you can say, the distance particle for the distance traveled by particle Q is, I just haven't been following my habit. You know what I mean? But they'll still give you the credit regardless of, what, of whether you write a sentence or not, but they want you to. I think that's the future, that they want you to write a sentence. You know what I mean? If it says justify either a table or a sentence, you know. All right, guys. Uh, do you guys want to look at the key for this or no? Yeah? No? Yeah, okay. 2019. Let's look at it. OneDrive. That's life. I haven't looked at this one yet, guys. Well, I mean, I did at one time, but I haven't looked at it recently. College board. Free response. Look at everything I have saved here, guys. Uh, can you guys see everything I'm going through right now? Oh, these aren't the scoring guidelines. These are the free response questions. I need the scoring guidelines. 2019. There we go. Scoring guidelines. It's not that one. It's not that one. Uh oh. Did I get the wrong number? Oh, it was calculator active. Oh, here it is. Okay, found it. Look what they did for letter A. It was worth two points. Justification using mean value theorem, and they have two possible ways. They found the velocity to be zero by the mean value theorem. There's a value, they use the letter C, doesn't matter. I use the value T between 0.3 and 2.8, such that the derivative is zero. Or the P is differentiable, continuous. I think we wrote that in the beginning. By the extreme value theorem, uh, we haven't really talked about extreme. The extreme value theorem just means max and min has a min between 2.8, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I like it. I think the extreme value theorem would have been harder to prove. Mean value theorem is short and easy, see? Uh, letter B, did we get 40.75? Yep, yeah, we did. How many points on this one? Uh, one, <laughs> using trapezoidal sum. And so just one point on that. Letter C, it was three points. Notice that they put absolute values. Oh, look, they put arrow for T equals A or T equals B, okay, whatever. Uh, and then they said the T is between A and B. So I, they want to see the interval. So I think maybe we are flirting with point or no point by not putting it in groups until you told me. You know what I mean? So I think we're flirting with maybe getting the point for the interval by stating T equals blah, 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 which is A, and stating T equals blah, blah, blah which is B, because we haven't necessarily said the interval. Does that make sense, guys? So we're flirting with that point. I think it's best if you literally say what they did right here. T is between A and B, where A is that, B is that. So we're flirting with the point because I just told you that top line up here. So we're flirting with that point. We're not sure if, we're, if we would get it or not, but this would get you the point for sure. And then there's letter B. I think on this one, without the absolute value, I think you would still get the point. I think, if I remember correctly from last year or from the last time we did the reading uh, there, because I didn't grade this one, but uh, but my my partner did. So, and then look, they wrote a sentence. The distance travel of a particle Q during the time interval. Oh, if you don't state the time interval up there, I think if you write it in a sentence like this, you would get, you would retrieve your point back. Does that make sense? All right. And then look at letter B or letter D. It was worth three points. And look, they accepted both answers, 5.188 or 5.187. Notice they don't write paragraph. They just write one little sentence, one little sentence, so and then one little sentence. So they want you to write. You don't have to write a lot. Uh, for some of them, you wouldn't have to write, but yeah. All right, guys, let me come back.